Good morning to those of you tuning in from your homes and welcome again to STARS Virtual Circular Economy Conference 2021 Day 2. This conference is held in conjunction with Star Media Group's 50th anniversary. And thank you for joining us this morning and we hope you've enjoyed day one of our virtual conference and are looking forward to another day of inspiring sessions from our industry expert speakers. Wherever you are joining us from, we hope that you are staying safe and taking care of yourself during this pandemic. My name is Myra Baiti and I'm your host again for today. Let's now recap the aims of the Star Circular Economy Conference. The circular economy is a model which involves sharing, leasing, reusing, repairing, refurbishing and recycling existing materials and products for as long as possible for a sustainable and better future. It aims to redefine growth, focusing on positive society-wide benefits. It entails gradually decoupling economic activity from the consumption of finite resources and designing waste out of the system. Our purpose for this conference is to bring you, our audience, thought leaders and industry experts who would not only share their experience but also inspire and challenge you to adopt a circular economy model in your own businesses. Before we kickstart day two, on behalf of Star Media Group, I'd like to give a special shout out to our sponsors who have made this event possible. Thank you to our platinum sponsor, UOB Malaysia, and our gold sponsor, Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center, also known as MAGIC. We are now on day two of the Circular Economy Conference, and today we will see more exciting discussions as well as sharing from our speakers. To learn more about the conference and the speakers, you can scan the QR code here at the top right, or you can go to bit.ly slash circulareconcon2021. Now, before we get started with the conference today, here are some housekeeping matters. I'm sure at this point we are... A too familiar with online events, um, but as much as we strive to provide top quality production for all of our events, some things are beyond our control. Um, and we would appreciate and, um, and be very thankful if you can bear with us should we experience any technical difficulties. If you do need any assistance, we will not leave you hanging. Feel free to contact our event squad at events at the star.com.my. And if you have any questions for our speakers, for our Zoom viewers, you may post it in the chat box. And for viewers on Facebook, you may post it in the comment section. Lastly, and most importantly, please engage, learn and enjoy. We will kickstart our day with a panel discussion. We have a powerful lineup of industry experts to share their insight on the three P's of sustainability, protecting while maximizing and benefiting from the three P's. Our first guest is Eng Leong Go, Managing Director and Head of Malaysia Singapore Business Area for BASF Malaysia Sindian Berhad. Eng Leong has over three decades of experience in the industry and has been in various positions in Malaysia, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Germany and Taiwan. Next, we have Aaron Patel, founder and CEO of iHandal Energy Solutions, Sindian Berhad. iHandal is a thermal engineering solutions provider that recycles and repurposes wasted thermal energy in buildings and industrial processes. The company is devoted to creating a better environment for future generations with a mission to save 200,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions annually over the next decade. We also have our panel this morning, on our panel this morning, Dr. Mahadi Mohammad, the Executive Director of Green Growth Asia Foundation. Dr. Mahadi completed his PhD in Crisis Management from Management and Science University, Malaysia, and is currently pursuing his Master's in Sustainable Development Management at Jeffrey Sachs Centre in Sunway University. And last but not least, our moderator, Pam Lee Wen Ai, Executive Director Advisory at BDO Malaysia. Pam works on corporate finance engagements, including due diligence, corporate valuations, IPOs, mergers and acquisitions, and independent advice for related party transactions and takeovers. This is a power-packed, solar power-packed panel session, and they are getting ready to impress upon you all of their opinions and their insights and I hope that you and the audience would enjoy it as well. If you have any questions, again, drop it below in the chat box or in the comment section. The panel is getting ready and we will be with you soon. Bye. Sustainability framework that looks into an organization's social environment and economic impact. The first one, people. 
positive and negative impact an organization has on its most important stakeholders. And these include employees, families, customers, suppliers, and communities. The second P, which is the planet, is the positive or negative impact that an organization has on its natural environment. And this includes reducing its carbon footprint, usage of natural resources, our active removal of waste, reforestation and restoration. And the third P, arguably the most confusing one, is profit, which is the positive or negative impact that an organization has on the local, national and international economy. Some people want to define profit in a narrow sense, which is the financial profit of the company. But the bigger focus should be the prosperity or societal profit, which includes creating employment, generating innovation, paying taxes, and, and wealth creation. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Pam Lee, and welcome to this first session. With me here today is Mr. Go from BSSZ, Aaron, I Handal, and Dr. Mahadi from Green, Green Growth Asia Foundation. So let's start with the first question. Let's start with why. Why is it important to develop an overall circular economy model and the sustainable practices? Mr. Goh, do you want to start first? Yep, I can do. Good morning and thanks for having me here. Why do we need this model? Let's look into it with the growing populations uh, that would demand a lot of energy, food, water, housing, transportations, and everybody would like to have a better life. Uh, so with it itself, it will put a lot of pressure on our earth, uh, on the resources, not to mention also how to deal with the waste that we generated and discard every day. Yeah. Uh, so to us itself, business as usual is not an issue. It's not an option, not an issue, it's not an option. Let's just look into like Malaysia. Uh, we started with 6 million in 1957. Today we are 64 years later, we have uh, 33 million of our populations. And fast forward another 64 years, we are talking about 130 million or more. How can we cope? So th uh, that is where we see you know, something has to happen. And it has to come from the, this uh, business uh, segment to lead this change. All right. Aaron, what about you? What, why is it so important to, to develop this circular economy and have sustainable practices? What business value do you see? Sure. Good morning, everyone. I think one of the biggest challenges uh, in sustainability is always getting everyone involved in part of the solution. The whole supply chain right up to the consumer, which is us, right, you and me. Creating a better environment can't be done just by one party, right, which we always just push the buck, whether it's just the government or a manufacturer, right, of your favorite product, but it involves everyone. The challenge is always incentivizing people towards taking action and making the right choices. Unfortunately, sustainability has always been considered a premium option, right, something that costs more or is generally just more inconvenient, right? You got to, you know, if you have just done groceries, you got to pay more for that sustainable or cleaner variant, right? And people think twice about that. However, the right incentives are in place, such as that in a circular economy model, right? Where everyone stands to gain. Or sometimes, unfortunately, penalties in the form of legislation, right? Uh, in other countries when all else fails. It then starts making sense for everyone to be part of the solution. It creates new business opportunities, whether it be in technology, right? In materials, which is what some of the companies and panels are doing. Right, uh, to then power these new processes and business model and make businesses like ours relevant. Right? Businesses, at the end of the day, are all about providing solutions to problems and moving towards this new circular economy model right, that everyone's focusing on creates a whole new set of challenges with plenty of problems and business opportunities for us all to resolve. Thank you. And Dr. Mahadi, what do you think? Thanks, Pam. Um, distinguished panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the, star, the staff for giving uh, Green Growth Asia solution the opportunity today. Um, with regards to the um, circular economy, I think um, just to echo the other panelists and just to continue a bit on what have been well said by uh, both panelists, 
um, for us, uh, Green Growth Asia Foundation, um, we strongly uh, have the basis or focus of education at heart. So in encompassing and also to encapsulate all of the circular economy model, uh, there needs to be sense of awareness and also education um, to prepare for the uh, next generation in the society, um, policy makers and also leaders. So for us, uh, we have to get that awareness and understanding right from the beginning, especially uh, we understand that um, um, circular economy is a, a systematic approach to economic development uh, designed to benefit businesses, um, society and the environment as what you have mentioned rightly just now, uh, Pam, uh, the 3P. So um, in contrast to the uh, uh, take, make, waste a linear model, I think the circular economy um, is a new uh, regenerative uh, by design and aims to um, gradually decouple growth uh, from the uh, consumption of uh, finite resources. And um, uh, I think it's, it's not a zero-sum game. So um, in Japan, it, um, the term uh, circular economy is, is fondly uh, known as um, zero waste. So I think that's where the heart and mind should be. And, and, and I, I really would like to applaud the star because um, circular economy should be a national team and, and this is definitely a good, good impetus for it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mahadi. Now, Aaron, you are the founder of iHandal Energy Solution, which focuses on recovering and recycling wasted energy. So what you do is you capture wasted heat from buildings and you channel this recycled energy to be used for cooling or heating. And you do a lot of work for industries, hospitality, and healthcare. So, so please tell us more about what your company is doing and how this helps with sustainability, COVID, people, planet. Aaron. Yeah, sure, Pam. So iHandal is a turnkey or you know, those are one-stop provider of solutions that recycle and repurpose a different resource, something that you can't experience or something that you can't see, but you experience on a daily basis, which is heat, right? Everybody's familiar with recycling waste, but how many people are familiar that you can actually recycle energy, right? So whenever I mention what iHandle does, where we focus on heat, the usual knee-jerk reaction I get from people is, why do you do that when we're surrounded by it, right? There's so much heat around us. What business do you have generating heat, right? Why aren't you focusing on cooling, which is what we're all paying for? But unfortunately, what people kind of forget, which is one of the most basic science principles, right, we understand back most probably in high school, is that there's no such thing as cooling down a space. Cooling is the process of removal of heat. So you're never cooling a room, you're removing heat from a room and the byproduct is cooling, right? So that is the foundation of our business model uh, and the core principle of our proprietary solution, which you call the heat fuse uh, concept. We do this through a three-step process where we find ways to capture energy. Then we concentrate it up to a useful temperature, right? Uh, to then make it more meaningful, uh, depending on the application that Ryan has, and then supply it as an alternative form of renewable energy back into the building of process. So how does that all look in real life, right? I know it's been some time since we've been out and about, uh, especially to a shopping mall uh, with the MCO and lockdowns, right? But when you park on a basement car park and get out of your nice, comfy, air-conditioned vehicle, the first thing that greets you, right, as you open the door is that blast of warm air, right? Uh, and, and that's a shock and you, and you run into the mall and you kind of forget about it in the nice cool space. So what we do is we're able to capture all that heat in a car park, for example, which is no different from a warm production floor, right? Or any other form of heat or even the heat outside your window right now. We're able to convert that into cooling or even hot water or steam to then replace alternative energy sources like diesel or gas that the building might have been using to generate heat. And by doing that, you're going to be cooling down that space. You're going to have cooler car parks and uh, what do you call it? More sustainable operations in the building, right? Because they don't have to burn gas or diesel anymore. So we're active across business segments uh, since the pandemic hit, right? We noticed everyone requires our help because like not everyone requires cooling and heating, right? And we've been focusing on delivering value right down from the retail consumer. So to the small restaurants, you know, that we buy our favorite meals from right up to the largest manufacturers. The challenge in our industry vertical is that people forget that it's equally important to look at energy efficiency as they consider switching over to renewable energy resources, right? There's no quick fix, right? Switching to a cleaner energy resource or definitely re-provide savings compared to the baseline uh, in terms of sustainability. 
but they're just wasting a cleaner energy resource if you're not looking at energy efficiency, right? You could just be throwing uh, it down the drain. For example, at homes, I think everyone in the lockdown has noticed your energy bills has gone up significantly, right? If you're cooped up at homes, so using your aircon all the time, right? And yes, there's, I mean, there's those practical advice where, you know, switch things off and they're not in use, turning up the thermostat. But the problem with efficiency is everybody thinks it's a sacrifice. If I put my aircon up at 25, 26, it's going to be warm. Sure, I can save money and save the environment, but it makes me uncomfortable, right? So what we're providing is you, there's, no, there's no reason to be less comfortable or have to um, compromise in any way. Look at the problem is you're trying to cool down a room or remove heat, like I've explained. But if you're not looking at insulation, heat is getting into the room again, right? right? That's energy efficiency, right? If, you, if at the moment you solve your insulation problem, you can still maintain your room at 23, 24, right? And you're saving energy as it is. And that's how we tackle the problem with customers uh, and clients alike. So as a result of us partnering about 130 clients to date across about 10 countries, uh, what we've achieved is about a 300,000 tons reduction, reduction for carbon emissions. And everybody talks about carbon emissions and how many tons they've reduced. But what does that actually mean, right? That totals about 1.3 million acres of forest, right? That we have actually helped uh, to offset in equivalent or taking 65,000 cars off the road annually, right? And we have an ambition to work with even more clients and partner with more individuals to take that 200 million tons to hopefully take Malaysia carbon neutral. Thank you, Aaron, for sharing. Now, is the goal um, to accelerate towards a circular economy more plastic waste needs to be recovered and reused. I understand that BASF supports the Global Alliance to End Plastic Waste to enable this circular plastic economy. And BASF has a circular economy program. Could you elaborate further on your approach to sustainability in your organization? You know, people, planet, and profit. How do you create that mindset in your business and how do you make your stakeholders, your customers, your suppliers part of your uh, journey to sustainability? Go. Thanks, Pam. Uh, that question is pretty long and cover a lot and it would take me hours <laughs> to answer all. But uh, let me try within these uh, five minutes. Uh, let's start with the, our company uh, corporate purpose. Since 2004, globally, BSF, we have only one purpose. Uh, that is, we create chemistry for a sustainability, sustainable future. So inside this itself, we strive to balance economic success and environmental protections and social, societal acceptance. It's very mouthful, I understand that, but it effectively covers the three Ps that uh, Pam, you are talking about. Now, how to create a mindset in, in Malaysia? Let's say, for example, in our plants, in, we have few plants in Malaysia. So what we start to do is to look into the safety and health of our people. We make sure all our processes you know, are safe enough to operate. Our people can operate it in a very healthy uh, environment. We look into air emissions. We look into wastewater. We look into the scheduled waste. And in our Faboon site, uh, we, it's a German word, uh, we call it the uh, integrated chemical site, like the one we have in uh, Guantan, where uh, the waste of one plant is the incoming feedstock for another plant. The extra steam from that plant is the energy uh, input for, uh, for the others. And we use all these two pipelines, and there's no waste in between. That is one way we do it in our plant. And we strongly believe if we take care of our people's so this is safety and health, then only they will start to take care of the environment. It's not the other way around. Yeah, you cannot expect people to take care of environment when they are not working in the very safe uh, and healthy conditions. So that is one part. For the outside is a circle. You know, we look into our supplier and the customers. Like, you no. Know, in our sales team, and uh, these are technical support, we ask them to look into the, what are the things that is there really need to do. We emphasize create value. We emphasize reduce risk. That is uh, the way we manage sustainability. And we did solve that it is, uh, we focus more on the value creation rather than cost cutting. Yes, we still have to manage our cost, but we think that it is, uh, 
creating value is much more sustainable rather than cutting costs. Because uh, once you keep on cutting costs, one day you will come to cut corners. Yeah? And we don't allow that to happen. So what we do is uh, now we work together with the customer to co-create solutions that solve their problems. In the plastic waste, majority of plastic waste are bottles and the flexible uh, packaging. Most of it are PET, PP, PE based. based. That BSF no longer produce and supply. Uh, we divested all this business a long time ago. However, being the leading chemical company, uh, we feel it's our calling to do our part uh, and to put all these plastic waste polymers into a circular this, uh, manner. Like how to extend the life of the PPPE through this uh, plastic additive or light stabilizer. To, and the chem cycling is another of these uh, things that we look into it because there are a lot of uh, plastic waste where you just simply cannot do it uh, via mechanical process at the economical level yeah, that consumer is willing to pay. So many of these solutions are this uh, uh, global so that we just copy and paste from Malaysia. But in Malaysia itself, because uh, we have the glove industry, we have uh, this uh, palm oil industry, which are uniquely Malaysia. So we ask all our sales people and the technical service guy to look into what are the sustainability challenges faced by these two unique industries. You know? And then from there, that it is, uh, we bring it to our researchers in uh, globally, you know, uh, like Germany, China, India, uh, Japan, and ask them to help create a solution for us. Now, there are many of these uh, industry players that we are working with. Uh, I'm not going really, uh, to, to touch too much on that. So on the customer side, it's quite straightforward. And with the regulation coming in, it will help to speed up. Without regulation, it can't yeah, to really move in the one direction. On the supplier side itself, uh, it's much easier for us because uh, we pay them on one hand. On the other hand, we also ask them to follow us. Like for example, we now ask them to look into their carbon footprint uh, because we guarantee our carbon footprint to the customers. We also ask them that it is, uh, are, are they violating any international uh, labor law? Uh, and uh, this uh, last part that uh, we source responsibly uh, for example, in the palm oil, uh, we buy more than half a million tons a year of uh, kernel oil and uh, palm oil for our chemical process. We make sure it's 100% RSPO certified. Our target is by 2025 to achieve this. But last year for our kernel oil, we already achieved 100%. So that is how we BSL do on the customer side. We look into the sustainability challenges of theirs. On our own, own production, we look into ours and then we help our suppliers as well to make sure that we are in one line uh, solving this problem together. Then back to you. Thank you, Go. I like how you mentioned that value creation is more important than cost cutting. That, that I really like. Now to Dr. Mahadi. Just a few days ago, I read about Green Growth Asia Foundation planning to to carry out a sustainable schools program in Langkawi with the support of Kedah and other organizations. And this is indeed amazing. Could you tell us more about green growth and how you drive sustainable development at the Green Growth Asia Foundation? And how do you go about changing mindsets and engaging with the stakeholders? Dr. Mahdi? Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. Uh... Well, when I first uh, came back to Malaysia from uh, after living in Germany for about uh, seven years, so I find that there's this um, um, gap between um, the what the government wants to do and also the uh, implementation. So after brainstorming with a few friends, so we came up with the idea of uh, Green Growth Asia Foundation as a uh, non-profit organization uh, incorporated uh, dedicated to supporting and promoting um, strong, um, inclusive, uh, sustainable economic growth in developing countries and emerging economies, but also at the same time understanding the um, sustainability aspect or the circular economy aspect or model of um, uh, complementing each other. Because um, as we understand in many um, de developing countries, as you mentioned rightly just now, like deforestation, the palm oil issues have always been a very unique Malaysian issues. But we do not have a focal understanding on how to voice out 
to the international audience or international organization of uh, what is the practices that we're doing, the sustainability aspect of it. And that's where I think um, GGAF, uh, in short, try to achieve the um, economic growth that is socially inclusive and um, environmentally sustainable where I think society fully embraces a, a green lifestyle. And um, just to share, Pam, we are very um, action-oriented. And um, so far, we have been uh, very active. Uh, and you see in my background, Eco School Spera. So we have just launched our Eco School Spera. So we have started with Malacca, and then uh, we moved to Kedah. And then uh, now we are in Perak, and we are fully supported by uh, WWF Malaysia as the country coordinator for uh, Eco Schools program. Uh, it's a UN accredited program, internationally recognized. Um, and currently, we are very um, excited because the reception amongst the uh, school students are very encouraging. In fact, they have been asking us to have more programs. Um, despite the pandemic, we are still active uh, um, online. Uh, as a matter of fact, tonight at 8.30, I'll have a session with, them, with the students also for Eco Schools Perak. So uh, just to answer your question, Pam, we believe in um, um, the power of education uh, as the dri driver for um, sustainable uh, development and also circular economy. Um, I think uh, um, environmental sustainable development uh, in education would empower the learners with um, knowledge, um, skills, uh, values, and also the attitude to take uh, informed decisions and make uh, responsible actions for environmental integrity, um, economic viability, and more importantly, a just society for the future. So um, just to keep it brief, uh, we have uh, six key education programs in line with the uh, sustainable development uh, goals and sustainability principle plan. Uh, but for today, I've explained about the Eco Schools program where um, we have started uh, a few years back and I think so far we have gotten good traction. And uh, at the same time, we also have another program called a Young Reporter for Environment, um, which is also an accredited United Nations program that we have brought back to Malaysia where the um, school children, the university students will be the eyes and ears for us in reporting the uh, environmental issues surrounding them. And this could be another way of, you know, children being creative with social media now. So they'll be able to highlight the issues or the suggestions um, rather on how to improve uh, whatever practices that they see um, um, around them. And um, I would like to take this opportunity also to um, invite the star, um, the panelists to be part of the exciting journey and hopefully you'll be able to create more impactful programs uh, in the future. Thanks. Yes, yeah, yes, Dr. Mahadi. So please, please send us your invite to be part of your program. And I'm sure uh, Aaron and Go will, will, will try to collaborate and for the better good. Yes, uh, we're still waiting to see whether there are any questions from the audience. So dear audience, if you have questions, please uh, post them. Zoom or in the Facebook Live, and we will get to answer them. But while we wait for the questions, I've got one question for the uh, for, for the panelists here. Uh, for those, I, I'm sure there are some people in the audience who are trying out, trying to start their sustainability journey. And so, is there any advice you have for these corporates who are trying to start their sustainability journey? Understandably, not everyone is like BASF, or not everyone has a business model like Aaron. Uh, but what advice do you have to, to those who are starting out their sustainability journey? And I'll start with Go. The sustainability, I think the younger generation are much more receptive to this topic. Uh, recently, we have quite a few of these uh, uh, fresh graduates joining us as uh, management trainees. They came in, they asked specifically, what are we doing? So the older generation is of that it is, uh, I think, as I said earlier on, if we don't really look into their health, their safety, it will be very difficult to convince them that they should do more for the environment. Yeah. So if you have that kind of uh, ecosystem within your organization, it's much easier. I think the key part over here is to make them understand what are the challenges that we have outside of our plant. And 
help, let them understand also what would be the impact to our current generations and to the future generations. I think many of us, we have kids. Yeah. Some of our senior uh, uh, employees, they also have grandchildren. They care for them. But you have to connect them in the sense that it help them to understand what two things. One is our action today, what is the impact to the future? And the other thing is, what are the problems that will accelerate more or become even worse if we go for the business as usual model now, 10 years, 50 years down the road, and help them to understand all this, then you will be surprised. Many of them have a lot of ideas and they can come in. Yeah. Okay, uh, since you're talking, go just stay right there because there's a question for you. Mr. Go, do you need a big budget to kickstart a circular economy model by factory, is mid size, and old school? No. To answer you, for our sustainability roadmap in Malaysia, we did not spend a single cent on it. We use our existing manpower. The, as I said, you know, if you manage to get all the employees together, look into what are the challenges that in front of us today and ahead of us 50 years down the road, there would be a lot of ideas coming. We did not engage any consultant to do it. It's a common sense. And also that it is, uh, yes, some solution, if you don't have the solution now, you may have to go through this uh, R&D or not to put, there will be money. But as long as you are able to create value out of these actions, the investment in this will be, this, uh, recover, it will be covered. Now from some from your business, yeah. So I wouldn't really want to say that it is a circular economy is expensive, yeah. But I would like to say definitely, if we do not address this now, the cost to make up of what mistake we are making now today will be much more expensive fifty years later. Thank you. We hear you go. Uh, I'll move on to Aaron. Aaron, there's a question for you that your company's concept sounds really interesting. But uh, the the audience is asking what uh, what can a small shop, a small player do to apply this same concept of converting waste heat to energy? Sure. Do you have an answer? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's just one of the solutions in our arsenal. We have multiple solutions that help customers, right? Uh, no matter what business you run, right, heat is a problem of yours because you need to cool down your space. Right, even if it's a small shop lot, right, you're spending money even with no customers coming in, even with MCO, right, because you still need to operate your kitchen or your back of the house to still serve customers. So we have various other solutions, not only just converting heat into energy, but to actually optimize how you consume cooling in a space. How do you actually use the optimum settings for your various uh, key energy consumers? And we do that through a digital solution that complements our hardware. So I mean, if you want to learn more, just reach out to us. I mean, uh, we're happy to help because we're doing it purely out of uh, CSR point of view to help out uh, everyone right now that really needs to reduce operating costs uh, in this challenging climate. Right, just reach out. Yeah, for the person who asked the question, please feel free to reach out to Aaron at the uh, iHandal Energy Solution. Uh, Dr. Mahadi, there's a question for you. Uh, let me see. Would you, would you have some solutions or good suggestions on how to convert mindsets of staff or corporate know, to tech and tackle young minds like students, but the older. So it's not quite something. So it's, it's talking about how do you change the mindsets of people for young people and old people. It's something like what Mr. Go elaborated just now. But let's hear from you, Dr. Mahdi. Sure. Thanks, Pam. A very interesting question. Um, this has always been uh, a recurring question, I would say, whenever we uh, meet with uh, students and also their parents. Well, uh, actually, what I would like to mention is that um, we have to probably start small, try to understand the situation and surrounding, as what uh, Mr. Go was saying just now. So um, a lot of the corporation feels that they need to invest to do this, when actually it is um, not so much on the investment, but on understanding of how we would be able to reduce the waste or to reuse uh, whatever resources that we are currently uh, deploying or using. So uh, having said that, a lot of the traditional um, um, model, actually, if we look back at our parents or grandparents, are actually uh, implementing circular economy where they would very carefully reuse or reduce whatever resources that they have, uh, trying to minimize the cost and trying to minimize the impact 
without being able to um, really put in a very uh, circular model way, but actually I have been implementing it before. And um, I think I would also like to mention that the change of habit. So if you start small, you understand the issues around you that you need to address to. And by building up the um, habit, then you'll be able to turn that into routine where entirely you'll be able to uh, do it or implement it without really uh, realizing that you are, you are doing circular economy. So Thank yeah, that, that would be the answer. Thank you. And another question for you, Dr. Mahadi. How do you foresee circular economy implementation in Malaysia? And which country in the world offers the best ecosystem that we can follow? <laughs> thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, well, um, I would really feel that the country is moving. I mean, Malaysia is moving towards that. And as I've mentioned earlier, um, a huge um, applaud to the staff for taking this uh, very um, courageous step to start uh, talking about circular economy as a national theme or national agenda. And, and this should not be uh, just a, a flavor of the month or, or just a one-time thing where it should be a, a, the, the uh, stakeholders or the ministries and agencies should be galvanizing the effort and support, also engaging the private sector, the uh, public at large, to always have this constant um, conversation or discussion about circular economy. And, and I think if we are ready to do that, then they'll be able to move at least step by step ahead of this um, uh, issue. And, and uh, just to... Uh, answer the question on which countries. I, I may be biased because I was living in Germany for a while, but I think Germany would offer uh, one of the best ecosystem which, which I mean, the country can emulate. And, and to be honest, nearest would be um, Japan, where I think they have, uh, or Korea even, where they have even, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, make it a habit, a, a routine in their daily life where a circular economy, or in Japan, they call it a zero waste, is a, a, a mindset that's inculcated within the younger generation. And I think uh, hopefully we will be able to reach there soon, uh, hopefully. Thanks. Thank you, Mahadi. And we will take one last question from the audience. And this question is for Aaron. Aaron, how far along are you in your mission to save 200 million tons of CO2 emissions annually? And COVID-19 disrupted this mission, Aaron? So just two years ago, our original target was just 2 million tons. That was two years ago. And we revised it at 200 million tons because we foresee that we'll, we'll hit about 2 million uh, tons annually by next year, right? Uh, and, we're gonna, and we were hoping to achieve that in 10 years. We managed to achieve that in three instead. And we pushed ourselves on a 200 million tons. So now we're only at 1% of our new goal. Right, but we're, we're growing our impact exponentially by about threefold every year. So we are on track based on our current projections. And COVID hasn't disrupted our mission, it's actually accelerated it because like what Mr. Gore mentioned earlier, right, this journey doesn't cost anything. And we've done our business model where going on this journey with us doesn't actually cost our clients anything. Right, It's through a shared savings, through a partnership model. And where customers are more keen now to generate savings because of the operating environment, everybody's more keen. Right, uh, to look at sustainable options, right? They deliver bottom run results, and that's what we're doing. All right. Okay, I think we've got another minute left. So let's just tackle one question which just came in. And I think this question I will give it to Mr. Go. Do you provide any incentive to your employees or your organization's employees to encourage them to be more committed to be sustainable? Any incentive? Put it that way, our bonus system is tied in with our return of capital employed. So if we are able to do it, there is uh, much assembly in our plan, meaning less wastage. Now we, that money will be showing up in our bottom line. If we are able to create that value for our customers, we will have a higher margin. That also will have an impact to our bottom line. So in that sense itself, that is uh, every employees of BSF will be rewarded if we do our part correctly. Because we have this remuneration uh, package globally, it's the same, uh, tied in with our return of capital employed. So I hope that answer you. 
we don't have a specific this uh, incentive for specific targets kind of stuff yet. It Thank is our all. DNA. <laughs> yeah, it's your DNA. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, panelists. Thank you to the audience for tuning in so early this morning. I must applaud you. Give yourself a pat on your back. Now, uh, so. Um, And now I will hand over back the session to Star Media Group. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank you so much to Pam and the panel for sharing all of your ideas and all of your insights with us. Um, but the morning's not over. The rest of our morning, we'll explore case studies and sharing from our industry experts who have weathered great experiences to bring their businesses to where they are today. Let's welcome our first case study speaker for this morning, all the way from Canada, Mr. Felix Bock. Felix Bock, the founder of and Chief Executive Officer of Chop Value. Felix founded the Chop Value Microfactory franchise concept, where he developed an innovative closed loop engineered material. Motivated to create a global impact in the bamboo industry, he has gained experience by working on projects and supporting companies of all stages in over 20 countries with his firm Crosslink Technologies. Under Felix's leadership, Chop Value has discovered a powerful way to connect the circular economy to his expertise in wood and bamboo composite materials. Today, Felix will be sharing on the topic of making waste a resource. A quick reminder to those tuning in, if you do have any questions for Felix and our experts, please post it in the Q&A box or in the comment section, and we will address it during the Q&A session together. So Felix, take it away.
uh, good morning to Malaysia and uh, hello from Vancouver, Canada. My name is Felix and I'm super happy to be invited on day two to present today um, on what it means to take waste into a new resource. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Chop Value Manufacturing, a circular franchise concept that I'm uh, introducing you to today. And uh, I'm talking a little bit about waste and why we should actually never use the term waste in a modern circular economy movement. So I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little, little bit more about my journey uh, the next 10 to 15 minutes. And hopefully we can have um, with a very engaging audience from all over the world today, um, a few question and answers after uh, these 10, 15 minutes together. Um, I'm going to start with a very powerful picture on how my journey actually started. Um, when you look at this big, big mountain of uh, construction and demolition waste from a very rapidly changing housing industry. Many of us just look at it as waste. When I was standing in front of that um, with a, as a wood engineer's background, all I was thinking is that this is what truly opportunity looks like. And I asked myself, how did we get there? How did we get to a, to a point where we looked at this mountain of resources as waste? Why is it that we think it's easier to go into a forest and harvest trees just because it's easier and faster, um, even though we have all the technology readily in front of us to actually utilize all that construction and de demolition material that you see that comes out, out of our urban environment. So it got me thinking. Um, at that point, I was a young engineer coming from the industry, working for um, uh, big big named companies and I, I felt like I can I can have a better impact. Uh, I was also working at that time as, as research assistant at uh, the University of British Columbia here in Vancouver, uh, Canada, and my job was to utilize underutilized resources better for new products and new solutions. And I was like, okay, I mean, I don't have the means to invest $10 million. And everyone I asked didn't have really the, the understanding why uh, why we kind of lost track of our resource efficiency. And maybe some of you all over the world think of Canada as a very forestry driven and very um, you know, innovative country in the forestry sector, but I don't think that's the case. I think we have a problem. We have a luxury problem. We have too much forest, so we don't have to be necessarily that efficient. So my thinking was, what if I could challenge the norm? And I could say, we are starting um, and we're working towards a circular economy, one chopstick at a time. Chopsticks, you know, for you are even more meaningful than for me. They have a huge cultural meaning. Um, they have a long, long history, but they're also one of the number one disposable items around the world that travel thousands of kilometers, thousands of miles from one place, mostly a bamboo forest in China, to another place probably to Malaysia to four, in 3,000 kilometers or to North America in 9,000 kilometers. And we're using them for 20 to 30 minutes and then we're throwing them away. So I was a naive young engineer who thought, what if I could come up with this inspiring story to create a viable business concept called chop value uh, on something simple like a chopstick? And if we could achieve this successfully with a chopstick, can we scale that? To, to, to bigger opportunities. If that inspiring story becomes true and we're creating that new performance material, could we scale that thinking and actually challenge the norm and, and, and be a little bit rebellious and tell other people that, hey, this works, like if this works with chopsticks, imagine how many other wasted resources we have in our urban environment. So we, we call this urban harvesting. We create innovative, high-performance materials for commercial and residential spaces. And when you look at that beautiful picture, we are highly densifying millions of millions of chopsticks per year into new beautiful products. And it really had to take this, um, you know, kind of crazy German engineer like me who started recycling chopsticks from all these restaurants for new materials to kind of send a message worldwide um, that we can do better and that every little action counts. So if you want to look at one slide that is my favorite slide of all time that actually explains um, how we can create value to something that is worth nothing, 
or was previously defined as worth nothing, then I want you to look at this slide. I call it the 100 billion chopstick business opportunity. So to North America alone, so I'm based on the West Coast in North America and Vancouver, but to North America alone, we actually import more than 80 billion chopsticks per year. And we're throwing them out after 20 to 30 minutes, if it wouldn't be for us. So it's a neglected urban resource because we think it's just a small little stick, but it's readily available in front of us, readily available to urban harvest. So I was thinking, if, if I come up with the idea and I'm identifying something that was previously zero dollar at waste, and I'm identifying it as a resource, trust me, there are many, many great ideas out there, but it's still worth nothing unless you do something about it. And that's what we did. We, we literally started with something simple like cardboard bins with our logo on it. The logo comes from one of my first interns because she always was really happy. She came into the into the lab in the morning and she always said, good morning, Mr. Felix, with the big sign. And this is what became the, um, the logo at the end. And uh, these cardboard bins we have in all the restaurants that then separate the material for us. And the moment you have identified a resource and, you, and you're picking it up, you're putting labor into it, you're driving around a very efficient route, you actually have a material cost. And now you're putting a value on what was once a resource worth nothing. But if I would have listened to all these traditional and conservative thinkers uh, who told me maybe you can make flooring out of it or maybe you can make particle board out of it, we wouldn't be in business. What we are creating, we're creating end products for the end consumer that actually um, with its design can carry the story of circular economy and the story of sustainability and can carry that story right to your home. So that when you see these hexagon tiles or hexagon shelves on your on your wall, you can point on them and can tell your family, hey, I do something good for the environment. I feel good about the decisions I make and I have thousands of chopsticks on my wall. Let's talk about it. And this is the value creation. When you look at that value chain, we're actually achieving factor 148 in value from the raw material to the end product, which is quite significant and the number one reason why we are actually in business and have a scalable business. Our team and our brand says that each product that we make, each product that we purchase that is maybe becoming part of our product, glue, uh, um, um, packaging, every product has an impact. That might be negative, that might be carbon neutral, or that might be positive. But we decide for our company that every product that we have, we are measuring, because we are aware that it has an impact. And if we can achieve that it's at least carbon neutral, or in many cases of our products, it's carbon negative. So it actually stores more carbon that, than it releases during the production process. Then we can feel truly good about our viable business model to work towards a circular economy. How we do it? Lean, efficient, and made local wherever you are. You know, you always have to look at a crisis like COVID to remind yourself what you're best in. And that's why I put this very, very simple slide here. All we are, we are lean and efficient. And we wanna make sure that everything we do is always made local wherever you are. So if you're, for example, today based in Kuala Lumpur or Singapore, or if you're calling in from Ho Chi Minh, or maybe you're calling in from North America, our vision is that in every city that you're located, that there will be in the future <clears throat> a local chop value microfactory that recycles urban resources, manufactures the products and distributes the products locally so that we don't have to ship materials and products all around the world, which is one of the biggest carbon emitters um, out there. I wanted to show you a few pictures so that you, you're not necessarily thinking I'm totally crazy recycling chopsticks for a living. We, we create entire beautiful interiors just like that community table that you see in front of you. That big table is around, uh, I think, three meter 50 long or around 12 feet and is recycled of 33,000 chopsticks and turned into this beautiful new space at one of our partners called Little Kitchen Academy. We're also creating restaurant interiors. I think it's super important that you're actually designing and building products that you can loop back into the economy, in the economy that actually recycles with 
um, uh, with you. So we are trying to design uh, materials that our restaurant partners can actually afford to purchase back and go closed loop. We're doing a lot of beautiful sustainable home decor products that actually carry the story to the end consumer, to you at home. And every single product label consists out of the number of chopsticks recycled and the carbon emissions stored to tell you the story of how much impact you create with every purchase you make. Um, all the way to home interior. So you can see we're even testing the material for performance and, and hardness and durability uh, on these stairs. And um, it's really exciting for me as engineer to actually develop a beautiful new material out of something um, so fun and, so, and, and recycled because it really uh, shows you how much value you can create with the technology and the innovation we, we, we readily have available and developed. And obviously residential and, and home interior that makes it, makes it fun to develop. So I'm not sure if you had the chance before um, you joined the conference to, to go a little bit to our website at chopvalue.com, but we actually have um, come quite a far way. So uh, we started a few years ago and now uh, these humble chopstick beginnings are actually getting expanded globally. We have now franchisees in Canada. We are about to announce our first location in the US, but we also recently announced our first location in um, one of our turnkey locations in Asia, and that is in Singapore. So I think uh, Singapore is close by, uh, so I hope you will have the chance to visit them one day and see um, how everything is done in person. But um, to us, the main message here is that we chose franchising as a way to actually scale our impact. Franchising is our ideal growth tool to grow sustainably within the circle economy. Why do I think that is if we were just to be focused on success and profitability and we wouldn't have any other core values that is uh, related to social impact or environmental impact, the, the traditional way of growth is using a single factory and grow it massively hundred times as big at the end of the day. That would be the mega factory example of you know ikea or, or tesla what we are trying to do we're trying to franchise our business for independent owners in independent cities so that they can use their local resources for local markets with local talent and hire local people to fulfill these independent market needs and that's what i think is so powerful about franchising because we're all part of the same brand Every franchisee that works with us becomes part of our team, understands uh, who we are, um, and, and, and really buys into the philosophy of creating social and environmental impact. And that what, that's actually what excites me the most, to now expand that crazy story um, all over the world. And that's why I'm super excited to lead by example, to make a circle economy truly the norm. And uh, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, as a little example of how we can, in a very rel relatable way, turn waste, even if it's something small like a chopstick, into a new resource. And I hope you have a few questions for me at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so um, one of the questions, and I hope uh, um, to the organizers it's okay if I, I quickly read them uh, out loud. So. Um, it says, uh, you know, I can't imagine uh, a place like Canada would use so many chopsticks. And uh, what made you choose this as a resource other than using scrap wood? So um, my background as wood engineer, I'm always looking for uh, scale. Like I want to scale my ideas or my impact or even my product designs with, with something unique. So Scrap wood is something obviously right in front of us, readily available, but I felt like it's not as powerful of a story that, that, that would make others understand how big our problem of waste actually is. So I feel like if I would tell you today, hey, you know, I'm, I'm recycling shipping pallets and I'm making some furniture out of it, I think some of you would say, yeah, cool. I, I think that works, you know, maybe two, three businesses and, 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 and Felix is happy. But I think the big message here is really, if this guy, Felix and his team can create a viable business with something small and humble like a chopstick, 
I mean, imagine like if it works for something so small and simple, and and we have now you know multiple locations and they're all doing really really well. Imagine what else is out there. Scrap wood, of course, but but so many many other resources, and that's why I thought that chopstick might be the best storytelling material. Um, a part of its amazing performance because most of the chopsticks are actually bamboo and I studied bamboo my my whole career and I, I love it as a resource but a part of the performance I thought the chopstick might be the most unique and most inspiring storytelling tool to create change in our industry. Hi, Felix. Thank you so much for your sharing session. Thanks for having me. No worries. How do you feel? Good. Yeah. Well, it's 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 weird not to see everyone, but uh, uh, I hope I will make many new connections and we can all see each other one day. Yes, I really, really hope so as well. I think that franchise idea, if anybody in Malaysia and Southeast Asia is Hear this, please, please sign up for the franchise. <laughs> okay, so we do have a few questions for you from our audience members. Firstly, thank you so much to our audience members for the questions. If you have any more, do drop them in the bottom because I think we do have some extra time. So in the meantime, um, oh yes, in relation to the franchise, we do have um, some people who are interested in the franchise. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you become a franchise owner? That's a great question. So. Um, so every every um, new partner or development partner that they, that we would consider as a franchisee can actually visit our uh, website at shopvalue.com uh, slash franchising and then you can get a bit more information you know you, you need to understand a little bit more uh, is my community big enough uh, to, to start a micro factory uh, do I have the right skill set do I have the right team and obviously can I afford the investment so we we try to design um, the concept that it's accessible for small teams and small business owners. And then you go through a little introduction call with us. I, I try to join every single call as well to get to know new owners. And then we see if you're the right fit and if you understand our vision of making the circle economy a bit more. Wonderful. Just a little peek into your just a little peek into your shops. So what do the shops look like? What is the concept for the franchise shops? Yeah, I'm not sure if you if you're familiar in Malaysia um, of some of these uh, really cool micro breweries where you go into like a little brewery and then you see behind glass you see the industrial tanks and you see how everything is made. You can imagine this is very very similar um, uh, with our process because it doesn't it doesn't smell bad. It's all it's it's like a wood shop with specialized equipment, so you can smell the wood and you can see the woodworking, you can see the laser engraving. So you walk kind of into a little showroom where you meet the team and then behind glass, you see everything happening um, so that you can trust who is making your products and where they're coming from. Yes. Oh, my, that reminds me of going to Ikea, walking in and smelling it. Um, it's a whole different experience. It just makes exactly. me want to have, you know, a piece of the furniture. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. So I guess in relation to the um, franchise question, um there is a question on how do you find okay so this is a question do you find um did, do you find customers of your recycled products um accepting your products readily i think uh sorry let me let, let i think i'll rephrase this question do how do you um gauge the acceptance of a new area towards your products yeah i think uh, much of it is uh I think there's a new generation of, 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 of uh, young professionals or, or young people uh, that know we don't have another choice than making sustainability commercial. And it, it shouldn't be a, like a differentiator anymore. It should just become the norm if we want to you know, live healthy and live longer. And I think we see this with our brand really, really well. When we uh, approach, for example, a restaurant owner and say, hey, do you, do you want to recycle your chopsticks with us? And the answer is yes. And then we say, hey, in the future, if you want to renovate your restaurant, would you purchase, you know, uh, like a carbon neutral, sustainable tabletop from us? Or would you purchase one that flies all around the world, is produced out of something that you actually don't know, 
and is and has a plastic top on it. So, you know, if you give people a choice, I hope the choice will be more conscious and more sustainable and with scale of our concept, obviously then also becomes the price competitiveness to make it um, accessible for everyone. Thank you for saying that. And I sincerely hope the same as well um, in terms of awareness. Agreed to now. Uh, okay, so we have a few more questions. All right, um, this one is, okay, so this uh, our audience member says, hi, Felix. Um, I would like to know how the challenges, what are the challenges that you encounter or still continue to encounter in further developing positive impacts through the circular practices? Yeah, um, I, I'm also going to say hi. Um, hi to the unknown. Um, you know, there are obviously challenges every single day. And I, I honestly don't even know why, because uh, if you have a very positive attitude uh, like me, and I think I'm, I might be a bit too optimistic on, 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 on most of my days and maybe also a little bit naive, it actually helps you to stay positive. And uh, so positive change, you often ask yourself, why is not everyone thinking like me? You know, why is not everyone thinking as efficient like me? And why, why do we feel good about um, making purchase decisions that are not as sustainable as, as Trap Valley products. So, uh, you know, as we, as we develop our concept, we obviously need to grow our team and that means we need to grow our sales. So yeah, it's hard to convince uh, many of these traditional thinkers, traditional brands, traditional department stores um, to actually buy into your vision and then also buy your product. But we have had great success, um, especially over the last 12 years, You had a little bit more time at home to think about your decisions and that was the exact same thing in, in business as well and we were fortunate enough um, to be on the right track yeah yeah i know what you mean and i, I think ever since COVID 19 um there's there's been a renewed uh, well those at home if you agree with me or disagree with me do let me know in the comment section but i think there's been more of an awareness or, or a, a, a valuation, an increased value onto what is outside, because we're stuck inside, and that yeah. includes um, Earth, Mazagaya. So yeah. that's been a. Has that affected your business? Um, has that affected uh, the way in which you, uh, the business, is being run? Um, yeah. Yeah. No, it's a great question. So, I think what COVID and nineteen allowed us to do is come together as a team and just have a really serious conversation and remind each other what what we stand for and why we exist so we really nailed down during COVID-19 our core values why uh, why did we start our value what do we want to achieve and why do we want to achieve this so I feel like we definitely strengthened uh, our core values and then the simple approaches of we want to only work with brands that appreciate the path forward we only want to work with brands that that understand our vision. We only want to sign up franchisees that actually are buying into our philosophy and know the truth behind doing good business. And then the simplest of all rules is never make business with assholes. <laughs> That's a good philosophy. <laughs> all right, so thank you so much for that. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have. Thank you so much, Felix, for joining us today um, and also for sharing your story, your inspiring story with us. I genuinely hope that you continue to be optimistic. Anytime. Thank you so much for having me, everyone. No worries.
guys. So that was not, I really, I really hope that you guys enjoyed that last session, but that was not the last session. We also have another case study. Um, and this case study for this morning will involve two speakers who will be sharing on the topic of buying for impact, creating impact one purchase at a time. Buy for Impact aims to promote a socially conscious buying behavior among the public. Our speakers will be sharing from the impact business under the Buy for Impact movement. So, who are our speakers? We have Mr. David Lim, the Assistant Manager in the Societal Innovation Team at MAGIC. MAGIC has been actively supporting the seeding and scaling of social enterprises via capacity building, access to market, funding and skills, as well as policy consultation for the government. Prior to joining MAGIC, David has worked for more than a decade and volunteered in several social enterprises and green technology companies across Malaysia. Joining David is Mohammad Tare al Fatari, founder of ER. TH or Earth. Earth stands for Electronic Recycling Through Heroes, an award-winning social enterprise specializing in collecting electronic waste from households and businesses. The company has successfully diverted more than 350,000 kilograms of e-waste from landfills and serves over 2,500 customers such as DHL, Volvo, Shell, Dell, United Nations and many more. Once again, if you do have any questions for our speakers, please do post it in the Q&A box or in the comment section. Um, they are getting ready for their, uh, to, to share their story. Uh, hopefully, you guys are getting ready to hear them out. Um, see you guys soon. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, this is David here from Magic. Um, and of course, together with me today, uh, as the host was mentioning, is Mo from Earth, which we're presenting later. So uh, from Magic's side, I'm uh, just going to go through a very quickly introduction of what Magic is about. Um, we are as magical as we are, as the name is. Uh, we are a government agency that is under the uh, Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, Marketing. Uh, we were incepted since 2014, and um, one of the key mission of MEDIC has been supporting social enterprises in Malaysia. So, um, probably your first question is social enterprise and what is social enterprise doing here at a secular economy conference. So, um, just a brief overview on what is social enterprise is basically a business entity that has proactive um, making, proactively making um, positive social or environmental impact, and also at the same time having a sustainable business model. It means they are a business entity, they are not a charity. And um, in order to sustain the impact towards the benefit, they are actually using a business need in order to secure and sustain the impact. And as buy for impact is actually one of the movement that we are rolling out from Magic to actually encourage corporate and also individual customers in um, promoting conscious buying and also support um, the social enterprises, right? And then, so the common challenges among the social enterprises is basically they have very low brand visibility. Uh, while they're making impact, they actually have less market access like other SMEs that you might see in the market. And also they have a common really in the, um, in the um, market. There's a, just a very nascent awareness among, about impact overall. I think the um, awareness about impact of sustainability overall right now, it would be mostly on the DSR. Um, which I think part of the buy for impact movement, we are trying to transform how corporate actually do CSR as well, not just a one-off charity, but also to procure and to partner up with the social enterprises. So these are some of the list of the social enterprises that we have. Uh, we actually have more than 400 social enterprises under our network, but under buy for impact itself, we have all this uh, over here as we listed. And uh, we have also filtered some of them just to show you um, those that is actually involves um, very heavily on circular economy. So how the social enterprise tying with um, circular economy is we have a lot of social enterprises that are working on uh, upcycling waste materials from used oil, from um, plastics waste, and also to seat belts to even agro waste 
where you can see we have nature renaissance, we have warming up, there's upcycling, the agro waste from FMB sector and also from the agricultural industry. And you can actually Google them up. And of course, Earth is one of the one that are targeting on electronic waste, which we will be presenting them uh, slightly later on. And these are some of the examples that we have to, would like to show with you. Um, so as mentioned just now, Nature Renaissance is actually focusing on pineapple waste. They are based in Johor, rightly about the uh, pineapple sticks that we, we have in the south. And affordable boats, uh, do check them out as well. Um, they are based uh, across peninsular Malaysia. And they're mainly using kanaf material in, to tap into circular economy. And also they are actually empowering the um, uh, rural economy into building affordable housing using this environmentally friendly material. And also with oil lilin is using um, used oil uh, into promoting uh, to make uh, promoting to retail customer to make into candles. And also we have BGBG that is actually um, quite one of the oldest uh, social enterprise here. Uh, that the uh, waste material like seat belts or banners and uh, making to uh, fashion accessories. And even they're partnering up with um, a kimono company to make into uh, upcycle fashion products. And um, as part of Buy for Impact uh, movement, we are also having a physical marketplace. But of course, due to the um, limitation that we have at the moment due to the pandemic, we also have an online marketplace, which you can actually scan a QR code over here or actually can go to our website, uh, www.buyforimpact.co to check out the social enterprises. And uh, you can see that we have also prepared some catalog for Raya. And also we are um, categorizing social enterprises by the impact pillar as shown over here. And do check out the websites if you want to check for some impact products and not just any um, other products. Um, and of course, part of this movement also, we also have session with corporates. We also organize like a tea time series to explain to the employees and the partners of the corporates to understand what is social enterprises and what does it mean to support social enterprises. And so actually for the corporate members or for the individuals, what can you do to support the social enterprise or impact businesses? is providing them market access by opening the door uh, to buy from them, to actually interact with them, to understand what is their impact. And uh, if you are skillful um, corporate members, you can actually provide a mentorship or perhaps some networking for the social enterprises. Um, and also at last is actually adopt them and partner with them to amplify their impact. So we don't need to reinvent the whole wheel. That's the whole message that we're sending. You just need to amplify it for a bigger impact. And that is the key message that we have for Buy for Impact movement. And you can keep in touch with us um, through our website or perhaps on our um, email address, socialcollab at mymagic.my. And now I'm going to pass to our social enterprise um, or electronic waste, Mo, uh, co-founder in Earth. All right, Mo, I'm going to pass to you. Thank you, David. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, at the Circular Economy Conference. David has done an excellent job about buying for impact but I'm here presenting you an idea about also selling for impact. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, so Earth stands for Electronic Recycling Through Heroes. And today we want to focus on how uh, we can help you with your uh, company's ESG reporting. So let's move to the next slide. So the average person uses about 200 electronic devices during their life, which means that after this person is gone, uh, there is about one ton of e-waste uh, that it stays around in the earth for centuries. Um, next slide, please. It's the world's uh, fastest growing waste stream. Uh, and uh, it, it looks just like a big, big pile uh, in the landfill. Uh, it becomes, if it's put there, it becomes non-recyclable. Uh, it causes a toxic pollution, and it's also billions of dollars uh, that are lost uh, forever. 75% of our e-waste end up in the landfills, unfortunately. Next slide, please. So this is actually what happens uh, when people uh, do not find a reliable way of collecting uh, those electronics. Uh, it becomes easier for them to throw it in the trash. And once they throw it in the trash, the value of, the, uh, of them drops significantly, and then it becomes uh, hazardous to both environment and health. And that's why we came up with a solution. Next slide, please. So our solution uh, is that we um, uh, use a network of freelance heroes 
they are regular folks who just have uh, cars or motorbikes uh, that sign up uh, to uh, collect uh, the electronic waste in their own neighborhood. Uh, and then uh, they bring it to us. Once it comes to us, of course, they get paid. Uh, the, the original um, owner of the item also get paid. Uh, and then we do a grading system where uh, grade A, reusable, grade B, repairable, and grade C, recyclable. Uh, and then we send each of those to uh, a different source uh, in order to maximize uh, the environmental protection, uh, also maximize the social good. So sometimes we refurbish the devices and donate them to B40 students. Uh, and, and then uh, we also maximize for economic value because we try to get the maximum uh, value out of the electronics that have already uh, been introduced into the market. Next slide, please. So uh, this is the first three months of 2021. Uh, these are all the uh, pickups that our heroes have done uh, around KL and Selangor. I didn't use the six-month graph because it would be too red and you can't read the names of the places anymore. Uh, but as you can see, uh, once you provide a convenient pickup service, then a lot of people uh, are happy to recycle. Next slide, please. So uh, we have worked with um, more than 2,500 customers. First, we started off serving the households, but soon enough, when our network grew bigger and our system became very efficient, we started to notice some of the world's biggest companies, uh, you know, including a DHL, NTT, and United Nations, and some big banks and so on. They started to, um, you know, like uh, use the booking system, which was for households, in order to book the collection because they didn't want to deal with the traditional subcontractors who required them to store large amounts uh, for a long time. So they would just conveniently clear out the items um, uh, bit by bit by by making a booking with Earth. Next slide, please. Uh, last year, of course, was a challenge for all of us. Uh, during the last uh, year's MCO, we had to completely shut down uh, our collection operation. But immediately when we came back, we had the busiest six months of our life, and we ended up growing as a company by four times just as a result of the pandemic. So uh, as you can see, there is more digital transformation, uh, which also means uh, more electronic waste. So we are also happy to assist there. We have paid, like last year alone, more than 50,000 US dollars in cash rewards uh, for, for the items. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here to uh, highlight a few examples that we have done. So for example, last year, uh, we did a campaign with Shell where you can drive to the gas station uh, drop your electronics based on the value of them. You can claim free fuel or snacks from the shop. Originally, it was supposed to be a one-month campaign, but actually the HQ requested that we extend it until the end of the year, and it was uh, one of the most successful uh, campaigns, and we have given out more than 10,000 ringgit worth of uh, free fuel and snacks uh, in return for people's recyclables. Next slide, please. We also have an extended partnership with DHL, where DHL aggregate all the uh, company's e-waste from its staff as well as its own assets uh, into their Glen Marie depot, and then our heroes are regularly uh, collecting from there. So DHL is leading by example and helping us to spread this word among the Malaysian business community. Next slide, please. And uh, this is a very dear project to me uh, because, uh, you know, we've worked with Hong Leong Bank as well as some of our other customers who decide that they don't want to get the cash reward. They don't want to get the cash in return for the recyclable. So they ask, what else can we do? And, and what can we do is we can use this cash to acquire uh, very good working condition devices and donate them to B40 students. So this year we have already donated more than 50 devices completely free of charge to B40 students. So if you're an organization that don't care about the cash reward, you can always ask us to channel it to the B40 in the form of working devices. Next slide, please. And uh, also uh, we are very proud of this because all the Volvo showrooms uh, in Malaysia today uh, have become drop-off points for electronic waste. So you can see this box at the Volvo showroom and you can drop your electronics there. And this just uh, enforces the image that 
e-waste recycling because it happens all the time. The average person in Malaysia produces 10 kilograms of e-waste per year. Uh, so this is something that happens on a regular basis. And if we don't have these receptacles that make it easy for people to recycle, unfortunately, much of that e-waste uh, will end up in landfill. So to summarize, our total impact, we have uh, collected more than 350,000 kilograms of e-waste since we started three years ago. Um, we have, as I said, donated 50 uh, laptops uh, free of charge. We have refurbished more than 750 laptops and provided them back to the market uh, in a very affordable rate. Uh, and to, nowadays, we can handle all the way from 10 kilograms up to uh, 10,000 kilograms in a single order. Uh, and we are um, officially uh, accredited by, by Magic as a social enterprise. Uh, and also, uh, we are an authorized collection center by the Jabata Alam Sekitar. And finally, uh, we are also named by the United Nations as one of the official uh, sustainable development goals innovation around the world. So we'd love to help uh, your companies, um, you know, uh, improve their ESG reporting uh, by doing all these environmental, social and economic activities. Um, so, uh, yeah, happy to take any question. Thank you very much. Hi guys welcome back hi all right so we have a few questions from our audience members so first of all i'd like to thank everyone in the audience thank you so much for sending in your questions um this is our engagement portion and the first question that we have is going to be for david um so the question is how do we become a part of the buy for impact are there any specific qualifications required and these are very much for retail products only, right? Question mark. So I guess that's three questions. <laughs> okay, let me address one by one. I, I think, um, first of all, um, so how do you sign up Buy for Impact Movement is, first of all, you can check out our website, buyforimpact.co that we we're sharing just now. Uh, or you can actually check out Magic website where we also have a Buy for Impact page where we can send to you the uh, link to sign up with the application form. Um, if you really can't find these links, you can actually send an email to sociocollab at mymagic.my. That's where you can get in touch with us to sign up for the campaign. As for the criteria, it's uh, basically you are social enterprise that uh, you're selling products and all services, and then you're also giving impact to the um, B40 groups. Uh, you have a very specific target beneficiaries. Um, so just to bear in mind is that um, we do welcome inclusive business to come to us, but I think the more, more important thing for this movement is to social enterprises that you have very clear impact, you're proactively making it. It's not just a one-off charity, so there's a main criteria. And um, then the last one, the last question is basically you can be actually supplying services as well, not just goods, and not just products, um, and as long as you can justify with us on your impact. Yeah. All right. Thank you, David. And thank you to our audience members for that question. Um, we have another question, and this is for you, Tariq. Um, all right. So this question is... Um, Ah, a convincing question on how to convince people. So this is the, the thank you so much, the audience members. This is, I volunteer for, uh, he says, I volunteer for recycling activities. And one of the biggest problems in Malaysia, most of the business owners here only look at profitability, but very little of them think of conserving the environment. And so I'm worried. May I ask any advice to change their mindset from Tariq? So... So uh, that's actually a great, a great point. And, uh, and, and uh, let me tell you how we address that. I, 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 about the other companies, and of course, I can't speak on their behalf, but the reality is that uh, uh, the recycling industry, unlike some of the other maybe sustainable uh, industries, like, for example, solar, solar power or something like that, we actually so far don't have any subsidies from the government. And that's why uh, the recycling companies maybe feel that they are, uh, you know, kind of out there to, you know, protect themselves. So that's why they play it safe and they just focus on the activities that make money for them. 
uh, how we address this issue is, is that we, from the very beginning, have registered ourselves as a social enterprise. And the definition of a social enterprise is that at least half of the money that we generate need to go to our beneficiaries. So who are our, our beneficiaries? They are the earth, the environment, and the second is our heroes. Uh, so this is the social good where we create income opportunities and then later on we refurbish the devices and donate them or sell them very affordably back to the community who can't afford um, the newer devices. So, so I think that social enterprises are so critical because they ensure that the, the entity that you work with um, has the greater good in mind, and at least 50% of their money is being spent on their beneficiaries. Thank you so much, Tarek. That was very beautiful. Um, and also, actually, while we do have some industry people who are watching this conference today, maybe what you guys can do is drop in the comment section or in the chat box how you would like to be convinced um, about on, on this topic, and then let us know too. So the next question is to David. So David, um, let, let's, um, the question is, uh, how did you come up with this idea? Um, and what is the, the values and philosophies behind um, the Buy for Impact campaign? All right. Um, so I, I think personally, it doesn't start with me. Um, this campaign starts actually way before me joining um, um, Magic. Um, this campaign starts about uh, end of 2016, 2017, when it first launched. It's really with a concept to actually expand the market access for social enterprises and uh, really to encourage the individual consumers and also uh, corporate consumers uh, back then to really um, buy from social enterprises to increase the revenue and thereby to support the social enterprises to increase their uh, impact towards the environment or to the beneficiaries, as Mo was saying. Um, so I think, uh, and then it expand towards now, which basically we encourage partnership between corporates and then with the social enterprises, um, not just through corporate sponsorship or one of charity, but actually uh, engage with them and partner with them in the long term to actually um, to, to exchange the practices in to create social innovation and social impact towards the community. And that is the um, latest idea about Buy for Impact itself. So it didn't start with me, it started with Magic um, in 2017 and really to expand the market access. All right, thank you so much, David and Tarek. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we've had. Thank you so much for sharing your solutions and your perspectives with us. We hope that we can see you again. Uh, do you have anything, last last things you want to say to the audience before you go? No. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, 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 this year, we are seeing a really a surge of uh, big companies that also want to do these kind of activities. So uh, we are actually creating a, a whole department just to uh, focus on corporate sustainability. And we would have an officer that is dedicated for this kind of thing. So please reach out to us if you want to work with us. Yep. And uh, do reach out to us as well. Uh, if you want to know more about other social enterprises and uh, what a social enterprise do, or you know how can you collaborate further with social enterprises, please reach out to us at Magic. And we would like to help you to connect with um, any like um, more. All right. Thank you very much for having Thank us you. today. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much, David and Tarek. And see you guys as well in the audience soon. back as promised we have another sharing session i know it's wonderful our next sharing session this morning is on the topic of trends and opportunities sorry trends and opportunities for plastics recycling in the circular economy let's welcome our speaker mr joseph po who is the head of oil gas and chemicals group wholesale banking within uob and oversees the business development a new solution rollout and risk management of the oil, gas and chemical sector within UOB. Joseph will be addressing Malaysia's roadmap towards zero single-use plastics by 2030. He will be exploring the key trends in extending producer responsibility globally and in Malaysia, how the growth of plastics recycling across the FMCG value chain can help reduce pollution from plastics waste, and also is the, what are the key challenges faced by plastic recyclers and the financing solutions which are available to them. 
So welcome, Joseph. But before I share the floor with you, just a quick reminder again, and I know I keep telling this, uh, I, I keep reminding you guys of this, but we really do love hearing from you. And we do hope that we are able to engage with audiences at home. So if you do have any questions, please Drop, drop it in the comment section or in the set uh, sorry or in the chat section or whatever platform that you're on all right guys get ready to hear from joseph
Hi, good morning, and thank you everyone for joining the session this morning. I hope everyone is keeping well and safe. My name is Joseph, and I head the oil, gas, and chemicals sector in UOB. This morning, I'll share about the trends and opportunities for plastics recycling in the circular economy and the financing solutions UOB have to support this segment. A quick introduction on UOB Malaysia. We have been in Malaysia since 1951 and is one of the top rated banks with a AAA rating from Rating Agency of Malaysia. We have the largest branch network of any foreign bank in Malaysia and we are very entrenched here. We have a comprehensive range of personal and commercial products and services to support your lifestyle and business needs. This morning, I'll be highlighting the increasing public awareness to plastics pollution and the reactions from various quarters. Next, I'll share what is meant by a circular economy and also go into detail on Malaysia's circular plastics roadmap. Finally, I'll share UOB's financing solutions for the plastics recycling ecosystem. Let's start by looking at the extent of plastics pollution globally. About 8 million tons of plastics find their way into the ocean annually Asia contributes 80% of global ocean plastics waste, and eight of the top 10 ocean plastics polluting countries are from Asia. Malaysia itself disposes about 1.1 million tons of plastics waste annually, and only about 24% of that is recycled. Plastics pollution, as all may be aware by now, harms marine and wildlife, and when it makes its way back into human food source, can also affect our health. So consumer awareness and sentiments are also changing. In a recent study by Sea Circular in 2020, 92% of Malaysians surveyed responded that they are extremely concerned about the issues of plastic waste, and 87% are personally trying to act on plastic waste matters. These results in Malaysia and ASEAN are consistent with a recent BCG Global study, where the respondents in a post-COVID environment are intending to increase their plastics recycling activities and reduce their plastics footprint. In Malaysia, 80% of the respondents believe that the government are acting on the issue proactively through policies and regulation, but only 40% think businesses are doing enough in the same area. So this is a potential opportunity for businesses to act on plastics waste and sustainability. This opportunity is further supported by a recent McKinsey study where consumers in Asia who were surveyed indicated they are most willing to pay more for sustainable packaging. So globally, many of the top FMCG companies have already begun to act. Both PepsiCo and Unilever have committed to have 25% recycled content in their plastics packaging by 2025. Nike has reported that 75% of their products contain recycled materials, while Adidas in 2019 estimates that it has manufactured 11 million pairs of shoes from recycled ocean plastics. This is done mainly through their partnership with Pali, an organization focused on ocean plastics pollution. So what is the circular economy as compared to a linear economy? According to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the circular economy is regenerative and restorative by design, and is based on the following three principles. Firstly, use of circular design to reduce and remove waste and pollution. Secondly, keeping materials in continued use. And lastly, to regenerate the natural systems. If you look at the middle of the slide, you can see that the cycle for plastics begin with the production via virgin or recycled feedstocks. These are used in daily life and commerce. Some of the resulting plastics waste are collected in line with various government roadmaps and legislation. The waste plastics are then processed into recycled pellets for reuse again to close off the circular loop. On the left side of the slide, we can see that current global plastics recycling rates are about 10 to 12%, and that is expected to increase to 40% by 2040. On the right side of the slide, we show that the main end use sectors driving the recycling growth are in home and personal care, textile, construction, and FNB. So 
So let's take a look at the EU, we tend to be leading global environmental efforts. In the EU, they have already banned plastics cutlery, straws, plastic sticks on cotton swaps and balloons. Plastic caps on drink bottles are only allowed if they remain attached. There are also efforts to reduce plastics in F&B and also to increase cleanup efforts. The EU is targeting plastic bottles to contain at least 25% of recycled content by 2025 and a 90% collection rate for plastic bottles by 2029. All these efforts are estimated to save the EU 22 billion euros from plastics pollution costs, a key benefit that these circular economy efforts can bring. In the United States, there are also similar efforts underway, though the regulations differ by states. So what are some of the key elements that support a good plastics recycling ecosystem? We are examining some countries which are currently showing a good recycling rate. This includes the EU and leading countries in Asia such as Japan, Korea and Taiwan. These countries have set bold targets in terms of plastics recycling rates. For example, Japan is looking at raising its reuse and recycling rate of plastic containers and packaging to 60% and 100% for PET bottles by 2030. What we see is all these countries have implemented EPR, extended producer responsibility, household waste separation, and single-use plastics legislation by this year. Let's take a look at the current situation in Malaysia. The total demand for the four main plastics type made from PET, HDPE, LDPE, and PP are about 1.4 million tons per year. Close to half of these go into packaging, and more than a quarter are used in electrical and electronics, and the remaining are mostly in automotive and construction. Of this, the recycling rate is only about 24%. We have about 76% leakage. According to a recent World Bank market study from Malaysia, some of the main reasons include a lack of local demand for recycled resins, and this is further exacerbated by the low oil price environment, resulting in virgin resins being comparatively cheaper. There is also reliance on imports of overseas plastics waste, which are of higher quality compared with locally collected plastics. There is also a lack of market data on pricing and volume to help in planning by the recyclers. The recyclers also lack working capital and are unable to cope with the payment terms of the collectors, suppliers, and buyers sometimes. Next, we look at the various efforts underway for the circular plastics economy in Malaysia, led by different stakeholders. These are the government, the industry, and the producers. So we begin here with the government initiative. Malaysia has put in place a comprehensive roadmap up to 2030, targeting zero single-use plastics. Some examples include, for plastic straws, the default at f and establishments now is no straws provided, and consumers will only be given them by request only. Whereas for plastic bags, different states in Malaysia will implement a 20 cent charge for them by end 2021. The roadmap also include increasing usage of bio bags to replace plastic bags by 2022 and expanding the scope of biodegradable and compostable products in food packaging and cutlery, plastics films, cotton buds, and slow-release fertilizers. From 2026 onwards, the scope of biodegradable and compostable items might be expanded to single-use medical equipment, diapers, and female hygiene products. By 2030, the roadmap also includes R&D funding of alternative eco-friendly products and rapid testing kit for Eco-1 compliant products. The Malaysia government also have various green incentives in place. This include the Green Income Tax Exemption, GITE, the Green Investment Tax Allowance, GITA. For the GITE, this relates more to green services and eligible activities and these can enjoy tax exemption of up to 70%. For GITA, this is catered for green capital expenditure, 
and 100% of eligible capex can be used to offset up to 70% of statutory income. There's also the My Hijau Green Labeling, where eligible products and services can qualify for the government's green procurement scheme. For these schemes and incentives, the relevant government agencies to work with is MIDA and Green Tech Malaysia. From the government initiatives, we next look at the industry initiatives. These are organ orchestrated by the Malaysia Sustainable Plastics Alliance, MASPA, an industry group formed to drive plastics circularity. The main aim of MASPA is to identify and eliminate five problematic or unnecessary single-use plastics items through redesign, innovation, or alternative use by 2025. MASPA also aims to achieve 25% of plastics packaging to be recycled or composted by 2025. The target is increased to 100% recyclable, reusable, or compostable by 2030. MASPA is also targeting to reach a 15% recycled content in plastics packaging by 2030. From the industry initiative, we move on to the producers initiative. The producers agenda is mainly driven by the Malaysian Recycling Alliance, MAREA or MARIA, which is a voluntary producer responsibility organization formed by 10 key FMCG companies, which are household names. This include Nestle, Unilever, and Coca-Cola. The goals of MARIA is to drive extended producer responsibility by organizing programs to increase collection of plastics for recycling. Some of the current targets that MARIA has set to achieve by 2030 include 95% collection rate for PET, HDP, and UBC, and 50% collection rate for flexible packaging. Next, I'd like to introduce you to UOB's Plastics Recycling Ecosystem Financing. At UOB, we have done quite a bit of research and interviews by speaking to various industry players and experts to understand the business flow across the plastics recycling ecosystem, from the collectors to the recyclers and converters to the end buyers, who are mainly in the large companies in the FMCG auto or construction industry. I'd like to focus on the main pain points faced across the ecosystem. For the collectors and recyclers, because there exists an informal system of collection, there will often be need to pay in cash for the plastics waste collected for recycling. The plastics recyclers and converters are often sandwiched in the middle between the collectors who are usually informally organized and end buyers who are usually large FMCG players. The recyclers and converters often need to pay cash upfront for the plastics waste, but may often get paid up to 90 days later from their buyers, resulting in a working capital squeeze. On the KPEX side of things, the recycling equipment, including the machine and most, could be a hefty cost, which the recyclers and converters will require upfront financing. Based on the pain points we have identified, UOB has put together a comprehensive financing solution which covers the working capital needs of the recyclers, including cash lines, as the informal collectors usually require cash upfront. With our working capital package, we also offer trade financing such as early payment discounting, accounts receivable financing, or even customized contract financing based on your long-term supply contract to the large FMCG buyers. Our equipment financing is customized with attractive LTV, repayment tenor, and even interest capitalization. To spur the growth of this sector, we have put in place a competitive pricing structure and fast track approval system. Please reach out to us if you'd like to hear more about our financing solutions. You can email us at sustainable-ct at uobgroup.com. Our contact details are also available at the end of the presentation, which is just two slides from here. So in addition to our financing solutions for the recycling ecosystem, UOB has developed our in-house green circular economy framework based on the objectives of the UN Sustainable Developmental Goals and catering to the different requirements of the circular economy, including material and resource recovery, circular designs and inputs, products as a service, 
and product lifetime extension. Vigil Iris, an internationally recognized ESG consultant, has provided a second party opinion to endorse our circular economy financing framework. Hence, for recyclers who are engaged in qualifying plastics recycling activities and are interested in our financing, UOB can work with you to provide the green financing accreditation under our framework, which you can publicize on your website or CSR reports. This will be helpful in providing the due recognition for your contributions to the circular economy and profile yourselves accordingly for your buyers who are looking to ensure their supply chain support the circular economy initiatives. I've come to the end of my presentation. Please visit our UOB Sustainable Financing website, where we detail the various green financing solutions we have across different industries. You can also email us at sustainable-city-uobgroup.com or scan the QR code at the bottom left side of the page to get in touch with us for further discussions. Thank you for spending your time today with me and happy to take any questions. welcome back thank you all right thank you so much for sharing with us we do have some uh questions from the audience from you uh for you so the first question is um okay so the first question is we already have uh government policies as well as companies who are um who are who are championing green products what is the purpose of having a green financing framework mm, okay so uh the purpose of having a financing framework are uh, many folds. Uh, maybe I'll just try to distill into some of the more important ones. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we recognize that green and uh, sustainable financing has only taken off uh, in recent times. And uh, integrating sustainability into business strategy is not easy, uh, especially for you know companies trying to embark on this journey. So our financing frameworks are designed to try and simplify this complex process and to provide a clear method to assess uh, what are green eligible activities, you know, highlight the qualifying criteria based on uh, recognized industry standards, and of course, uh, you know, avoid any concerns about greenwashing. So our frameworks and solutions are meant to make it simpler and faster for our clients to assess our sustainable financing. Mm. So alongside these frameworks, we also have industry reports and tools 
to help our clients, you know, make informed decisions about how they should embark on this journey. And we hope, you know, we can utilize, uh, they can utilize our green financing solutions to simplify the implementation of our sustainability practices for their business. Thank you so much, Joseph. And I think um, it was good for us to be able to address that question because I think a lot of people think about a green product, but they don't think about how to finance companies or how to create a way in which companies can convert. And uh, in, in that vein, we have also another question similar to that, but it expands upon it. Uh, the question mm. is, uh, what are the green financing solution frameworks do UOV have in place to support sustainability or the circular economy? Yeah, okay. Uh, that's a very good question because uh, uh, I think the main theme of the uh, event the past two days have been very much focusing on the circular economy. So besides the green circular economy framework, which I shared earlier, we also have three other financing frameworks uh, to support other industry and other green or sustainable activities. So firstly, we have what we call the real estate sustainable finance framework. So this mainly focuses on uh, green buildings and uh, within green buildings, there are many asset classes that we can support. So this can be data centers, hotels, industry buildings, office and residential properties and even uh, retail spaces. So the first other framework is retail real estate uh, focus. Okay, the second one is a bit more uh, sophisticated, I would say. It's what we call the smart city framework. So this is the first uh, dedicated financing framework from a bank in Asia. And this is uh, focusing towards the creation of sustainable smart cities. So what, the, what does it mean by uh, smart city? So this framework will support activities relating to climate change, uh, energy efficiency, you know, green building construction, green transport, uh, renewable energy, water and waste management. Okay. Uh, last but not least, we also have a green trade finance framework. And this is to support you know, your day-to-day -day trade financing requirements accompanied by uh, recognized industry certifications within some targeted sectors. So I, I know I just mouth off a whole lot of uh, financing frameworks that uh, UOB have to offer because we are really very excited, you know, and also want to support businesses in this area. So these frameworks, uh, you know, and solutions can be accessed via the QR code, which I shared with you earlier, or you can also visit uh, www.uobgroup.com/sustainability to find out more. We are very uh, happy to have a further conversation, you know, with you to see how we can support you on your sustainable journey. Thank you so much for that, Joseph. And also thank you to the audience member, Aldi Chan, for sending that question out. It's as if you know or you read our minds because, Joseph, we have a video also, right, after this? Sure. Uh, on green cities, yes. So um, before we move on to the video, Joseph, would you like to um, address, uh, would you, do you have any other uh, final words for the audience members? Well, I, I just want to add, I know, at UOB, you know, we see that the sustainable journey is something very important. And we hope we can uh, simplify, you know, businesses uh, embarking on this uh, area with uh, what we already have put in place. This is a constant journey. So we're happy to be supporting this initiative. Thank you so much, Joseph. And everyone, we have a video for you on Green Cities, courtesy of UOB. So let us view that now. See you guys soon. Cities are insatiable mega consumers consuming 75% of global resources and accounting for 75% of all carbon emissions. What if the Earth's natural resources fail to keep up with the rapid urbanization and population growth? Integrating sustainability into your business strategy is complex, but UOB can simplify it for you. Leverage our sustainability expertise to make informed decisions and access sustainable financing tailored to your business needs. Green Trade Financing future-proofs your business, builds resilient supply chains, and supports your sustainability initiatives. With minimal upfront investment, you can reduce your business and home's electricity bills with our energy efficiency and use solar programs. Those who are building, upgrading, or acquiring a green building can leverage our solution to obtain green financing. Financing is also available for plastic recyclers and buyers of recycled products. Our sustainable financing solutions also support projects related to renewable energy, wastewater management systems, electric vehicles, mass urban transport, and more. UOB's sustainable financing frameworks 
provide a streamlined and transparent process for you to access sustainable financing. Our capabilities coupled with our dedicated teams can help you achieve your sustainability aspirations and bring forth tangible benefits to the environment. Let us be your partner in forging a sustainable future by simplifying sustainability for you. Explore UOB's sustainable financing website to find out more. the video thank you so much to UOB for supplying it uh, ladies and gentlemen we will now have a short break and reconvene at 10 20 a.m um it's 10 20 a.m sorry 11 20 a.m so just grab a short break go to the loo grab a drink check some notifications on your facebook and join us soon because after this we have four more interesting case studies um and we will return soon so i'm Bayar Vaiti and i'll see you again shortly bye guys I told you I'll be back shortly and welcome back to STARS Virtual Circular Economy Conference 2021 Day 2. To continue with our session this morning, I'd like to welcome our next case study speaker, Mr. Vinesh Sinha, CEO and founder of Fat Hopes Energy Sindhyan Berhad. Fat Hopes Energy is the only organization operating regionally and it's completely focused on waste and residue-based biofuels and feedstock at an industrial scale based out of Malaysia. The company diverts waste and residue oil away from human consumption and towards advanced biofuel production, the cleanest way to drastically cut carbon emissions. So Vinesh is getting ready. Welcome Vinesh, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Vinesh from Fat Hopes Energy, and I'm here today before you to present to you 
a case study um, around a business that um, I would believe has achieved um, the circular economy and we continue to strive to want to keep this up. Um, before I begin, um, I want to just share that it's today the purpose of my presentation is really to um, make you understand how I believe every business um, can move into this area um, of, of the circular economy and with um, tweaks to the business model can achieve it. I myself um, have been developing um, multi-bottom line business models um, for the past um, 12, 13 years. And um, Fred Hope's Energy is one of the ventures that I've managed to bring this um, to reality. Uh, and I challenge everybody um, to think about your business model and to ask me questions at the end on how you can convert your business model from a conventional business to a circular one or sustainable um, a business model. So with that, Fat Hopes Energy has been in operation since 2010. Um, I developed this idea in 2007 when I was 19 um, and for the past decade or so have been at the forefront um, of looking at how we can convert um, waste materials towards biofuels. And we've used a variety of digital solutions um, to help us in this process. Um, and early adoption of um, digitization has been a winner. And I encourage everyone to embrace uh, digitization uh, in pursuit of achieving the circular economy. Next. So we all, I think, know the problems. Um, pollution is uh, uh, a significant problem. And all of us are to be blamed. We are all part of the problem. Um, the first and foremost, I think, is that we, we cannot externalize ourselves from the issue. We need to be able to understand the issue and we need to be able to take responsibility for the issue before we can actually look for a viable solution to solve um, the issue. So pollution um, is something that, um, it, it's, it's a big problem. Um, probably the only consolation we've had to, from COVID so far is the reduction um, in pollution thus far. Um, and that's due to the reduction in human activity. And that proves to us that we are a direct contributor to pollution. Um, the less we do um, in this situation, the less is more. The less we do or the less of our physical need um, to be outdoors, um, the less we pollute. And this is um, an unprecedented time. Um, look at this, we are having and hosting a virtual conference. Um, is it any less effective? I don't think so. Um, maybe it's even more effective. We can jump in and out um, of uh, meetings and we can be more productive. We spend a lot less time traveling. Um, but um, in every adverse situation, there is always opportunity. And we've presented right here, right now, two. Um, one is the pollution situation. And two um, is the COVID situation that's auguring well for the environment. So before I move on, um, I want everyone to realize that we have to assume responsibility. Um, and we have to realize that we are um, in some way or form or fashion part of this problem. And only when you are able to recognize that, then we can start to accept it and start to um, make a difference. Next. In the specific um, case of Fat Hopes Energy, from the early years of the business, we realized that um, many of the cooking oil that is available in uh, Malaysia is actually contaminated. And that's what you see uh, in front of you. Um, those are all of the brands um, of uh, cooking oil available at the in the market. And the black line um, at 25 uh, is really is, is the line um, of safe, permittable, um, edible limits. Meaning we are supposed to get cooking oil at 0% total polar compound and use it till 25% total polar compound. Uh, but what you see in front of you is new oil being tested in reference to total polar compound. And the findings were, 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 were mind boggling, right? Um, every single brand except the, the three on the far right um, at new surpass the 25% mark of total polar compound. And the ones on the far right are just below the 25% mark. And that shows you that um, a lot of producers know about this and they produce the oil just below the safe limits. Um, essentially what this finding um, brought to us was 
um, anything above 25% um, of total polar compound is a casinogenic material that should not be consumed. Whereas in Malaysia, every single one of them are at or above 25%, meaning we are all consuming uh, casinogenic um, oils with high total polar compound. And this is something that um, caught me by surprise and um, something that we thought we have to um, solve. And um, combining these two big problems, pollution one um, and contamination of cooking oil um, and uh, creating an unsafe um, food system um, was the challenge uh, we took on. And the reason I bring these two up in the front is because the first one was an environmental issue and the second one is a social issue. Um, so the challenge we were faced with is how do we have an economically viable business um, to deal with the environmental issue and the social issue so that we have a triple bottom line business where we have economic, social and environmental bottom lines all addressed. And I'll go on to share this with you. Next. So Ferrobes Energy um, was set out um, to develop sustainable fat, oil and grease solutions for the purpose of environmentally responsible biofuels production. Um, so we understood that if we can divert these waste oils um, out of the food stream um, towards an energy stream which would replace fossil fuel, we would be able to dispose of waste oil properly and we would be able to address the pollution issue right in the beginning um, as it would result in a less um, harmful or less emission uh, fuel, right? Um, so this is what we set out to do. Next. So how do we do this? Um, we aggregate a variety of waste oils and all of the 10 items that you see in front of you um, are the materials that we aggregate. So we built a supply chain um, around these 10 materials. So number one, we identified these materials. Number two, we, we determined the conversion paths. And number three, we built the supply chain around aggregating um, all of these materials. It's easy to say, but today we have um, many trucks across the region um, that actually go out and aggregate these materials and bring them back to our one of our 11 factories across the country. Um, and that all eventually gets consolidated um, in Port Klang, where it's then further refined before it's exported um, to oil and gas companies to be used um, as biofuel and replacing uh, fossil fuel. So we identify these materials, we determine conversion paths to these materials, and we build a supply chain around these materials to enable us to, in an to, in a economically viable manner, um, have industrial volumes of this, um, which um, then act as a raw material for biofuels, which will replace um, fossil fuel. Next. Um, so our key competencies around do, doing this, um, as you would have probably uh, guessed from, from the beginning of this, is one, we are data obsessed. Um, the only way we are able to identify these streams um, and to build a supply chain around it um, is, we, it, is with using extensive amounts of, of data. Um, a lot of these data are readily available, but it's about amalgamating them and making sense out of them uh, before creating actionable uh, plans on how um, we can build um, the business around it. Uh, number two, we're extremely financial logic and uh, we have uh, uh, immense uh, financial logic. And the reason for this, again, is because we understood very early on that if we don't make money, um, this business will not be able to propagate, number one. Number two, the solution or the problem that we want, the solution that we want to bring or the problem that we want to solve will not get solved um, if we are not able to continue to pay our bills and to be one of the best employers out there. Um, so financial logic is a fundamental uh, basis um, for the circular economy vis-a-vis -a, -vis a sustainable model. That's our belief. Um, and the third, which is specific to the business, um, is we realized that we needed to have an extensive and sizable fleet of vehicles um, with the experience in the area of waste oil management. And this is a key competency that you will have to determine or you will have to develop um, for your own business. Um, to set yourself apart. And as you can see, between data obsession and having financial logic, these two can be adopted in a variety of different businesses. Uh, but in regards to the third cornerstone key competency, um, it's something very unique to the business. Next. So as I've, I've mentioned, um, we um, find it paramount um, to find a way to keep these three bottom lines in equilibrium. 
And for me, um, it, it's in the order of sequence of economic first. Um, and, the, and the main reason is I remember very early on when I was optimistic, uh, my finance director, co-founder of the business asked me, would you be able to pay your staff with oil or would you be able to pay your staff with biofuels? Um, and the sad answer is it's no, right? Um, all of us need an economic um, incentive uh, to do what we do. And that's why for me, number one is economic sustainability. In everything that we do, it needs to be um, better, faster and cheaper. Um, and that's uh, something that we have to deliver from the onset. Consumers expect um, for a higher performance at a more equitable uh, price um, that will be able to deliver uh, a better performance um, across its life cycle. So number one is economic sustainability. Um, and number two for me is social uh, sustainability. And the main reason for this is um, as much as we want to save the environment, we want to save the environment because we want to keep mankind and society um, unharmed. Um, and if we don't, if, if um, uh, mankind goes extinct, um, what's the use um, of saving the environment? So number two for me is, is social sustainability. And number three um, is environmental sustainability. And this in itself uh, makes uh, sense because if, if we have an economy that is thriving or thriving, uh, economy and a society that's thriving, um, we will need to have a decent um, environment for us to be able to um, propagate the next generation um, for time to come. So economic, social, and environmental sustainability in that set order, it's something that's very important to me and something that I believe businesses should prioritize um, to be able to achieve uh, the secular economy. Next. So bringing it back to waste oil um, and use cooking oil in particular, which is um, where Fairhope's Energy gets the most visibility. Um, what we do is we service a variety of restaurants across the region. Um, we collect these waste oils um, after they've done cooking with it. Um, and we utilize that as a raw material. Um, so in every business, uh, think about how your raw material can actually be an upcycle product, number one. Number two, if it can't, how can it be a product that has got the least uh, impact to society and to the environment? Because then you start already with an unfair advantage. If you're using a, a raw material that has got high um, uh, 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 challenges or high issues or um, not very um, well uh, positioned in terms of a life cycle to society and to environment, your challenge of converting it to a circular economy becomes uh, multitude more difficult. So the first and foremost is look at your raw materials or your input materials into um, your business and think about how that can be changed at its source to something that you are either recovering like a waste material because then it starts at a life cycle of zero um, or how you can reduce um, the environmental and social impact of that material because it makes um, it a lot easier to achieve the circular economy or to be a participant um, in the circular economy if you start at this point. Um, and I think um, you, you have touched on buildings right in the beginning. A very good example is for you to um, be able to achieve a green building. You start with it at planning stage or the earlier you start with the adoption of green practices, um, the easier it is to uh, accommodate, number one. Number two, um, it becomes a lot easier to, um, re re uh, to develop a return um, on those strategies, right? A financial return on those strategies. Next. Um, so this uh, business conventionally um, was um, uh, operated like you see on your screen where um, you would go out and you would deliver drums, metal drums um, to outlets and you would, um, the, the outlets would fill that drums um, with oil. And in Malaysia, where our temperature is above 30 degrees, oil takes a long time to cool, right? Um, uh, because we are already pretty hot. Um, and that means that in every uh, uh, eatery, they would have two sets of fryers, one running and one on standby. Um, and that meant that um, they took up a lot more space. They were not very cost effective because the capex would double for the fryers. Um, and um, the staff would be exposed to hot oil because they would have to go and scoop the oil out of the fryers and put it into these drums. And as you can see in front of you, um, the drums have a really small hole. So you get a lot of wastage. 
Um, you get a lot of spillage, which causes accidents because the floor will be slippery. And you get a mess. I mean, look at those drums. They, they look horrendous, right? Um, so this was, um, this was the situation, and we had these big goals. Um, so for us, the challenge was where do we start um, in disrupting this industry? Next. So what we did was um, we developed a system that we call Fat Hope's Eye Tank. Um, and that's the tank that you see in that room over there in the, in, in the, in the restaurant, um, which was essentially a tank um, placed in the back of the kitchens, directly piped um, to the fryers. And when they were done with their waste oil, they would hit a button and the, and the tank um, had a pump on board that would siphon all of the oil out of the fryers into these tanks. On top of that, these tanks actually had an IoT sensor uh, pinging our database, informing us on what the fill level was. Um, so that we know when to service the restaurants. Instead, when we had the drum system, we would visit them every week. Um, and the carbon intensity of that was high because even if the drums were, were empty, um, we would have to visit the restaurants. But with a digital solution, that went away. Um, and we are able to service the restaurant 24-7. Um, and as you can see in front of you, the drive through would continue to operate um, even though we were there um, to, to clear their waste, um, which was unprecedented. Right? Next. So that's what it looks like. Um, and um, there were a multitude of different benefits um, that this system brought to the market um, when we implemented it, and it, which we didn't realize from the onset. Um, one is it increased um, waste oil revenue. And it did this because number one, this system deals with the oil, oil hot. And that meant that there was no possibility of, of wastage or filterage um, of this oil because there was no human intervention. Um, the moment they were done with their waste oil, they would hit a button, like I said, and it would be siphoned directly into this tank through an internal piping system um, that nobody could get their hands on. So the volumes of waste oil went up, which resulted in more oil to be sold to Fat Hope's Energy, vis-a-vis -vis them increasing um, their revenue. Number two, we drastically optimized the kitchen space, right? Because we didn't need two sets of fryers anymore, number one. Number two, is we took a lot less space even with the tank because instead of having six of those metal drums on one, in one layer, um, we went vertical and that meant we took a lot less space. Um, and real estate within these restaurants are really um, key um, or, or valuable. Right? Um, we improved the safety of staff because they didn't have to handle this oil anymore. There was no more prior downtime and that meant the productivity of that restaurant went up. Um, it was a secure and independent device device that reported to the internet um, or to our um, database on what the volumes are in each of these restaurants across the country. Um, it improved backdoor security because out now they didn't have to go into the kitchen. And that meant that the outlets could operate um, uninterrupted. Um, we now just service the outlets from um, the refuse chamber. And of course, um, it's a totally in, it's a, it's a environment compliant solution. And we have total transparency um, across the supply chain because now from the onset, even before we start aggregating these waste oils that will be destined for biofuels, we know where it's come from, how much has come from this location and when um, it was aggregated through our digital platform. Next. So every one of these uh, tanks that are now uh, installed across Malaysia and Singapore um, report live um, to our database. Um, and we are able to plan our logistics a lot better, number one. Number two, the person producing the oil has a much better level of visibility um, of where and how much of these oils are produced across their chain of restaurants and what happens with it. So they are a lot more involved um, in the entire sustainable supply chain and they can claim um, on the environmental benefits um, that this system has brought, giving them a higher level of motivation um, and reason to continue to pursue such models. And for us, I think this self-fulfilling loop um, is very important to instigate so that all stakeholders have a, have a need and have a want to uh, propagate it further and um, to be committed to it so that you see it happen for the long term. Next. Next. Yep, thanks. Um, so as I mentioned, all of these um, restaurants are connected. We get to see what the fill levels are, as you can see in front of you, and we get to see the locations, um, which is a, 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 a big jump uh, in terms of level of transparency in comparison to um, what it was before. 
retrospectively, when it was under the drum system, you would have to wait till the end of the month if you were a chain operator uh, before you actually knew how much was produced in which location. Um, and that didn't give a very high level of confidence. And because of that, one vendor never managed to secure the contract for an entire chain across Malaysia or Singapore. Um, they were broken up into a variety of different vendors, which for the corporation gave them a feeling of better control. But the reality was that um, it, it actually did not create um, enough accountability um, to up the ante on what could happen for the environment. Next. All of the uh, tanks, as I mentioned, report um, to um, our database, which then um, enables you to track and trace a lot better. Next. So this is solution has been adopted uh, by some of the biggest uh, chains across the country, and we continue to see long and fruitful relationships with them. Next. So um, getting to the financial bottom line, because of the savings um, on um, the number of fryers, we are actually able to reduce the kitchen by about 30% and half the number of fryers. And this resulted in about $4.1 million um, dollars saving per annum. Next. So the dark green line or the dark green bars are the bars of the waste oil that was produced prior um, to the adoption of this system. And the light green was after um, the adoption of the system. And this resulted in almost doubling um, in revenue um, over the course um, of these couple of months um, that this system was implemented. And this is where we really see an incentive of when you address the social and the environmental bottom line, you see an improved performance with the economic bottom line. Next. So as I mentioned, we have an extensive fleet. Next. Um, across all of these countries in Southeast Asia. Next. And employees across the region. Next. Um, and all of these materials come back to this location in um, the Klang Valley or in Port Klang, where we then produce a product that results in 70% less emissions. Next. So, um, next. Um, basically, um, if this system was, was implemented across uh, McDonald's globally, um, it would actually save them up to a billion dollars a year. And this is where we see um, the big advantage when you think about it, again, from a social and environmental perspective, um, the economic bottom line always makes exponential sense. Next. Next. So um, in conclusion, what um, I encourage everybody to actually pursue is to think on how your business model can actually address, like I mentioned, the social and environmental bottom line while creating a feasible business model around it so that you can keep it in motion um, and decades down the road, um, you have a viable business model that you can be proud of. Thank you very much, everybody.
thank you so much, Vinesh, for that presentation. I loved it. So you're telling me that your company is adaptable, effective, and is also able to not only save money for the companies that you work with, but also make money while saving the earth. I, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, and I think our audience members also have uh, have that interest in mind. And they want to know um, how motivated you to start this business. Um, they want to understand the mindset of the entrepreneurs, such as yourself, who are involved in the waste sector and creating impact. So, Vinesh, what do you think? Why do you get into this? Yeah, so um, uh, I need three main, main areas, right? Number one is um, don't overthink stuff. Um, I got into this um, because um, I was looking for a solution for my own car. Um, and I was an avid follower of Top Gear. I watched Jeremy Clarkson put used cooking oil into his diesel Mercedes, and I had to give it a try. Um, and it, it, it's that simple, um, right? So give it a try and really look. And I mean, it made a lot of logic because you're taking something that you would, you would conventionally throw away um, and put into your car. So that was the first point. Um, you need a trigger. Um, and then you then continue to believe in it. Um, the second um, real uh, thing that I've realized over the journey um, so far of my entrepreneurship is the difference between a failure and a success is the person who succeeded tried one more time. Um, so never give up. Um, when it makes sense at a basic level, um, it cannot not make sense again, right? So believe in the basics um, and do not overcomplicate stuff. And the third thing I think which is the most important is that never focus on the economic outcome. Um, if you have these two, uh, the basic fundamentals that make sense and your perseverance, um, economic viability or economic return will come. Um, as long as you stay rooted um, to the fundamentals, I believe that every entrepreneurship journey will succeed. Thank you so much, Vinesh, uh, for, that quest for the answer to that question. Um, so we are out of questions and unfortunately we are also out of time. Um, so that is the last question that we have from the audience. Uh, but before we go, um, Vinesh, do you have any last words to our audience members? Um, building back better um, has, is, is, we are in unprecedented times and I think it's very important for us to build back better. Um, and I um, urge everybody to really rethink um, how you do what you do um, because I think there's an immense opportunity um, for us to capitalize um, in, in, in the situation that we are today. So do not feel scared, do not feel fearful, uh, be courageous and go out and rethink how you do what you do. Thank you so much, Vinesh. There is no courage without fear. Um, and with that, thank you so much for sharing your journey and back to you in, in terms of the audience. We will be back soon to introduce the next case study. Thank you. Hi guys, let's get back to our circular economy business. Our next speaker will be sharing on the topic of revolutionizing water treatment. We have with us Dr. Mohammad Sharafatman, better known as Dr. Mo. He is the CEO and founder of Hydroleap. Dr. Mo received his PhD in environmental engineering from the National University of Singapore in 2016 and continued his research as a postdoc for a short period before starting his venture at Hydroleap. 
Dr. Mo is a water enthusiast who loves to couple engineering and innovation to create new solutions. As a reminder to our audience, please do post your questions in the Q&A box or in the comment section below for Dr. Mo. As, like if you are curious on what it is or what it means to be a water enthusiast, please do let us know. Um, and soon we will be, uh, Dr. Mo is getting ready behind the scenes and he will be with you shortly. See you guys. Good day, everyone. Uh, hope you've had a great conference so far. Uh, and thank you so much for having me here today. So my name is Mo. I'm the CEO and founder of Hydrolink. As you could probably guess, Hydrolink got to be got to be a company related to the water. So here, since the conference is about the circular economy, uh, I would like to uh, put some lights on the on the how the circular economy uh, can be performed on the water and wastewater and some of the practices uh, that we have done to to address some of the issues that we have in this in this in this area. So uh, what is a circular economy? Probably you've already heard this uh, before uh, throughout the conference, but the circular economy <clears throat> is an alternative to a traditional linear economy, which is the take, make and waste. So they take it, they make something a product and then at the end of the lifespan, it goes to the waste. So, but in a circular economy, it seeks to reduce the waste, recovers the resources at the end of the product slide and channels them back to the production. So uh, for a lot of the, for a lot of things that we are, we are, uh, we are dealing in a daily basis, this thing can be more uh, sensible, but how is that, does it work for the water? For the water, we are, first of all, water is one of the biggest resources that they have, one of the most precious resources that they have. But as we know, the amount of water, the, the portable water that we have around the world, it's very limited, less than 2%. So how we can, how the industries are taking this water, that is withdrawing this water from the rivers, from the groundwater, from the surface water, and they use it to make any product. Like if you think of the cars, if you think of any manufacturing from construction, uh, mining, tannery, textile, any type of manufacturing, food manufacturing, car manufacturing, they all use water and they generate a lot of wastewaters. So this wastewater, uh, a portion of it gets back to the environment, but the portion that currently gets back is very minimal. So how we can do the secular economy on water and wastewater as we, as we deal with more of the recirculating this water back to the, back to the production level. So, but there's a few of the problems with it. So, 
some of the common problems with the secular approach of the water, it's the regulatory and water quality issue. So what does it mean? It means that uh, I think of a production and manufacturing factory. So they use water to manufacture product and then this product gets used and then they, they generate quite a significant amount of wastewater, which is almost the same amount of water that they use. So for them to not withdraw the new water from the resources that we have, we need to make them to reuse this water. So we need them to treat this wastewater up to the level of the reuse. But there is one of one of the big issues that is still a lot of this uh, a lot of these companies they are dealing with is the water quality issue. So it means that even though there is a wastewater recycling processes and technologies, but still a lot of this company they can't really trust the water that they use for their production. That's one thing. And the second thing is regulatory. So there is still the cities, for example, one of the big examples is how some of the countries around the world, they have managed to use the gray water for as a, as a part of the resources for, let's say for the flushing or for the cleaning purposes, but not necessarily this thing is getting practiced in every around or every way around the world. So that's, that means that there is a regulatory still that it does not really homogenize along the along the countries around the world. Another problem is the cost of the water. So probably again, this one you are hearing it in the in the other dialects as well. Some of the things that we recycle, it gets it's great thing, but it's still the cost of cost of the usage for that water for recycled water sometimes is become more than 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 the withdrawing the fresh water from the resources. And the third one, which is to me is one of the biggest or biggest hurdle is the lack of awareness and dialects. It's still a lot of decision makers. Uh, we're talking about the companies, we're talking about the governments, we're talking about individuals that they have that lack of awareness that how, how this thing can, how uh, the water recirculation, the water, the circular economy of the water can happen. And they, instead of looking at it the waste, instead of looking at the wastewater, we look at it as a resource that how we can really bring it back to the operation. So from here onwards, I'll just give you some of the examples, some of the little bit of the story about the hydraulic and how we are trying to address some of these issues and give you a couple of examples of the great companies that have been in, is around on the front line to utilize the new technologies and uh, be brave enough to use something that it's unlike the technology that has already been around the world for the past 100 years or more than that. So uh, this is a little bit of a snapshot and the vision about the, so we, we founded the company in 2016 for with the same vision that we want to, we want to provide uh, chemical free, cost effective and automated wastewater treatment solution for a variety of the, this industrial applications. So, and we've been glad to be funded by both private and governmental VCs. So if you look at the problems specifically, so if uh, one of the main processes in wastewater treatment is the chemical treatment, that's where you use chemicals to treat the different uh, variety of the wastewaters. The problem with it is it's difficult to operate. It's, uh, it doesn't need to mention that it's not uh, environmentally friendly because you're kind of fighting fire with fire. You're using chemicals to get rid of other chemicals. So it means that you're generating the secondary pollutions, and it's a very extensive process. So we came up with the solution of the chemical-free process, which is based on the electrochemistry. So I'm not gonna go a lot about the details how this thing is gets done, but to put it very simplified, it's a kind of electrolysis back in the secondary school. You do have the anodes and cathodes, you give electricity, and then they do the job that the chemical is supposed to do. So, and what the hydraulic does is, we do have IP around how this thing gets done at the efficient level and at the scalable level. So we produce, we introduce a smart energy distribution, anti-scaling scaling as well as the self-maintaining. So it means that the systems, they operate and they self-clean themselves while they're reusing the water. So, and as well as that we are uh, more and more, we are developing um, the data transparency, one of the big problems with a lot of this wastewater treatment plants, as I mentioned earlier, one of the barriers is that there is no data transparency. What's the really quality of the water? How much of the water you're really treating? So we are providing this data transparency via the, via the cloud system. So the benefits, uh, it can go to the sky. It's first of all, the most important thing, it doesn't need any chemicals, it's only used electricity. 
which nowadays you know that it can be produced in a much cleaner ways. It's a very automated, there's no moving parts, so it means that there is not going to contribute to a lot of indirect, indirect basically carbon emission that we already have. And it's a modular system. So we started this thing at a very small scale, lab scale, we took it to the pilot, we took it to the commercializations using all modular systems. So it means that from one capacity to another one, you can always have more modules to it. So the outcomes speak for itself. Uh, if you're going to compare it to the convention, conventional system, you are doing it in a half of the space, 95% reduction in operating man hours. And as you can see that, uh, how this thing can affect the carbon emission as well. And directly and indirectly, we are, we are reducing 30 to 40% of the reduction in carbon emission. So this is, but I've said that all this, but at the end of the day, for the industries, if you're offering a fantastic, a sustainable solution, but if you don't have a cost effective factors in it, uh, the chances that the industry will take it on is really low. That's where we are going into combining this as a package that, hey, you can have a sustainable solution with at the lower cost. This is something that that's a lack of awareness that I mentioned. There's a lot of companies, sometimes they think it's good to be true or they have that lack of trust to be trusted. So that's where the governments can come in. There's a lot of schemes can come in. There's a lot of the pilots can come in to really prove that this thing can help the businesses. So a little bit more about the sustainability factors of the, for example, two of our main products that we have. It's one of them is the ECM, which per cubic meter of the water, you're nearly uh, reducing 0.4 kilogram of the carbon in the air. So, or another one is electrocoagulation, which is nearly 0.82 kilogram of the CO2. So, uh, a little bit of the visuality that how this thing can be applicable to a variety of the industries. We can talk about construction industry, to food and beverage, to the industrial wastewater. And the reason for it is because we are able to treat a variety of big contaminants, such as suspended solids, oil and grease, uh, heavy metals, COD, dye, color, and all of this. And the interesting thing about it is that a lot of the a lot of the clients that we already have at the first at basically when we approached them, uh, they did not believe that they can treat their systems, they can treat their wastewater using a more sustainable solution at a lower cost. This is something that is not just applicable to the water. This is the I've seen a lot of practices, a lot of new technologies that can be can be can be applied to the different corners of the industries that will help the circular economy, but uh, there is a lack of that awareness. That uh, it's a it's a duty of the companies, the startups, as well as the governments and the companies to to really uh, to find a middle ground to utilize these technologies. So uh, we do have a portfolio of the, for example, products from the filtration system, which is a chemical free, all the way to the electrical treatment, which is again chemical free, and we can integrate to a part of the wastewater treatment plant that is already exists, or we can provide the end-to-end solution for the clients. So uh, these are some of the customers, investors, and the partners that we work with. So we have came a long way for the past five years, uh, working all the way with the, with the water agency of Singapore as well, which is PUB, and some of the biggest construction companies or some of the overseas uh, conglomerate. But um, again, uh, there is a journey for it. and. As more of these companies they start utilizing it, they I'm hopeful that uh, not only hydraulic product and technologies, but also the other companies product in terms of the water they can be utilized to really change the face of the way that we do water and wastewater treatment. Because the reality speaking is, is still a lot of the treatment plants they get done exactly the same way as I would say hundred years ago. Yes, the machine got a little bit fancier but still the technologies are the same. So that's the duty of every one of us to, uh, to, to address that problem. So again, like this is about the, how we start from the pilots and then we move into the commercial models and for a different, for a different type of client. For example, for PUB, we are, it's a three years project that we are doing it for commercialization of the R&D project for desalinations that how they can they can do a better pretreatment at the lower cost and the lower chemicals consumption for the desalinations or for the runoff water from the construction sites or for treat recycling of the oily water treatment for the industrial wastewaters. 
Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, so I wanted to make it short. There is a video of the two minutes video of uh, which I would like uh, uh, the organizers to play it after this, and then which that we can already see that uh, what is really uh, the clients taking the benefits of the using NDU water and wastewater treatment technologies. Uh, please. AlphaTech is leading the world with new technologies and sustainability integration for construction sites. Partnering with HydroLeap for water treatment ECM, this unique technology enables companies to cut cost and repurpose water by eliminating flocculation agents, chemical waste, and maintenance regimes. The revolution is only getting started. Every drop of water in Singapore is precious, uh, and Facebook is committed to that throughout our data center. Uh, it starts with construction, and that's where we've chosen uh, to pilot this program uh, for use of this technology. But it goes all the way through the hyperscale DC that we're building. Uh, what we're going to deliver is one of the most water efficient DCs per megawatt in the industry. AlphaTech is a, a regionally based. Singapore is our headquarters, but we do projects all throughout Southeast Asia, uh, primarily focused on technical projects. So we like things that have a, a high technical barrier to entry. So data centers, clean rooms, uh, high-tech manufacturing. And so when we heard about HydroLeap, we were very excited um, because it's no chemicals, uh, it's less manpower, it's less power in general. So instead of having a full-time dedicated person putting in flocculants and all these other chemicals, we have this beautiful system that just uses electrolysis to bring the particulates out of the water. Uh, HydroLib is an innovative Singapore-grown company that provides chemical-free, cost-effective, and environmentally friendly solution that we can be applied to a variety of the industries. We help companies to cut on cost, save manpower, while taking another step closer to sustainability. For treatment of the silty water, or also known as the air control measures, we are offering a new way of doing it by replacing chemicals with electricity. So uh, traditionally the companies are using chemical-based ECMs that they use, they use coagulants and flocculants to treat the suspended solids. So this is the process that it's, it's very cost-intensive, occupies a larger space, it uses a lot of chemicals, specifically in a, in a raining seasons, and it requires very regular manual maintenance. So on the contrast, HydroLeague, we provide a chemical-free, cost-effective, automated, and the modularized and containerized solution. We pride ourselves in being a leader across the space, both in construction and the operation of our DCs. With successful delivery of this project and the benefits that we see on the early stages, we think this can be a positive impact on the industry and help influence the Singapore construction industry to adopt. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully the audience would have uh, enjoyed the video and thank you so much for your presentation as well. I think it's amazing that we are talking about water, what you mentioned about lack of awareness. I think water makes up about 71% of the world, <laughs> but we very rarely talk about it in terms of circular economy um, principles and sustainability. So thank you so much um, for that um, as well, that aspect. But we are going to... My address, pleasure. Um, oh. <laughs> so we're going to address uh, some of the crowd questions now. We have one for you. And the question is, oh, interesting one. All right. So let's see what you say, Dr. Mo. Uh, all right. The question is, how do you make the business profitable if the cost of redefining the water is higher than treating water traditionally? That's right. That's the... Uh... Uh, that's a great question and that's a million dollars question to answer as well. So actually the main reason that, uh, okay, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the introduction and then I will tell you that what, what it can be done for it. So uh, the thing is the water is a very, uh, very precious thing that is essential to a lot of businesses. And then uh, for the companies and for the users of this water to be able to switch from one technology to another one, uh, they need to take uh, enough of the enough of the practice into the considerations. Like for example, that uses been utilized for their production. Uh, the reliability of that that product will be in the line. And uh, 
one of the, I would say this thing can be solved, can be addressed if a few of the stakeholders can, can put their, their input into it. For example, it comes from the technology providers such as Hydrolift, such as the similar companies at Hydrolift. That we don't really take the approach of, the, hey, this technology is interesting and I want to just, I just want to make it commercialized because I think that that's, the, that's something that it can become big. That's not the way of commercialization. The way of commercialization is to really to know what's the problem in the in the industry and then take that one as a challenge, for example, for this one related to the water, and then we can make it we can make it uh, we can make it towards eventually making it cost effective. Uh, and there is a the good news that I can tell is the there's a lot of technologies out there that if there is a common and a proper partnership within the companies. And with startups, there would be a lot of opportunities for these companies to make that switch bit by bit. Nobody expects the big companies, they make the whole day operation suddenly from what they were doing to what's the basically new, right? So this company that they can start from a smaller skills and then see that how that works economic part of it, the, the trust part of it in terms of the quality and then make it the next level. So that's what we found it as the, the best way of the commercializing and getting the gaining the trust from the smaller clients as well as all the way to the big clients. But on top of this, there is a one aspect of it which is government can play a part. Uh, the government can come in with a lot of incentives, a lot of encouragement with to the actually the companies to utilize and take up a newer technology. This can come in both ways, can as a carrot as well as the stick. You know what I mean? Like you 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 you, you basically uh, encourage the companies to take up a better and more sustainable technologies, but at the same time, you can uh, tighten your regulation in terms of the water use. So, if all these parties work, they uh, play their part. I would say that will that will go a long way. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo, for that answer. And I think it's good to remind. I think it's good to to point out that I guess companies can do a lot, but we also need to help each other. To, to move forward um, into the circular economy. Um, and I think that's amazing. Um, and I, I applaud you for, for um, doing what you're doing. We hope that we'll see you again. Um, before we go, um, I'll, we, we've run out of time for the Q&A session, but would you like to address uh, the audience one last time before you go? Uh, um, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity that you guys provided. So uh, one of the reasons that I wanted to be on this call and one of the really requests that I have for everyone I'm sure that a lot of people in the audience, they are the decision makers at the different levels. One of the most important thing is that I believe that the biggest problem in the world is the environmental disasters. And if everyone takes a bit of their time to learn about sustainability, about the practices in the most personal and professional ways that we can do, that even it helps the businesses because these individuals at the end of the day, they are the decision makers at the businesses. If they have a better understanding of the water, they can make a better better decision at their work in, for their businesses. So yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo. And for My the pleasure audience, to be here. Oh, sorry. Um, and for the audience members, thank you so much for sending in your questions and for interacting with us. Thank you so much for being here. You being here, as Dr. Mo has mentioned, has, is going to help so much uh, in us moving forward. Uh, to adopt a more sustainable economy. Uh, we'll be back soon uh, and we'll see you in a bit. Bye everyone. Bye Dr. Mo. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Hi guys, I would like to thank all of you guys for being here. We've heard a lot of case studies so far from chopsticks to oil to water and soon we'll be hearing more as well because our next session is with Encik Shaiful, sorry, Encik Shai, Encik Saiful Azmin Nordin, who is the Managing Director of Landasan Lumayan. And Landasan Lumayan has been appointed by the Selangor State Government to spearhead the Klang Valley Rehabilitation and Redevelopment Project, which is also known as the Selangor Maritime Gateway, or SMG. Encik Shaiful has more than 18 years of experience in corporate strategy, financial restructuring, as well as strategic management. So, Welcome, Encik Shaiful. It is our pleasure to have you with us today. And he'll, he's getting ready and he'll soon um, be telling you how to divert waste from landfills. So over to you, Encik Shaiful. Good afternoon. Thank you for to the organizer for inviting me to share our experience in uh, managing the most challenging river in Malaysia, which is the Klang River. Uh, next slide, please. So first and foremost, I would like to introduce our company. We are a state link company owned by the Selangor State Government specifically by Mentu Besar Selangor Incorporated. We have been tasked to manage the Klang River, which has a strategic value not only to Selangor but Malaysia. As you can see, the Klang River, it cut across a very highly populated area from Ampang, KL, uh, Petaling Jaya, Shah Alam, until uh, uh, MPK, which is Klang Town. So, there's a lot of potential uh, when it comes to, clang, uh, to river development. Next slide, please. But uh, <clears throat> as we have been investigated, or we have seen so far in years, the Klang River has been neglected for quite some time. There are a few issues surrounding the Klang River. Number one, we have issues on the floating debris. Number two, on the poor water quality, generally class five, which is very polluted. Number three, there is no uh, river orientation development along the Klang River. And all this affected the marine ecosystem, which directly affected the livelihood of our fishermen. And also we have two biggest port in the clan, which is West Port and North Port, disrupt their operation. And also we have lost potential of providing clean water 
to the people. And in other parts of the world, if you can see, the river has been the transportation network for the population. But in Klang River, we have not seen Klang River as the transportation network. And also, there's a lot of uh, potential in terms of development along the Klang River. Basically, all above affected the reputation of Selangor and KL as the major contributor to the national GDP. Next. So what we have done so far from 2016 until 2020, we have extracted 67 metric ton of waste from the Klang River. And this picture was taken in 2015, somewhere in Shah Alam. Uh, next, please. So to put into perspective how, how big is 67 metric ton of waste, it's equivalent to 25,000 unit buses. So we can imagine we have 25,000 unit of buses in the river. And all this, even though from 2016, there is a reduction in terms of waste collected from 16,000 in 2016 to only 12,000, approximately about 27% reduction in terms of waste. But we feel that this is still does, it still does not meet our expectation. The river should be free from floating debris. 2021, from January until May, we have extracted about 4,300 metric ton of waste. On average, about 870 metric ton <coughs> of waste collected from the Klang River. Next. Out of 67,000 metric ton, we have done some analysis, study. 49% is organic waste or equivalent to 32,830 metric ton. 34,000 is non-organic waste and out of which 27,000 or 80% of the non-organic waste is a plastic. Next. Just to share our river cleaning uh, existing operation, what we are doing in the Klang River. From the floating debris, we treat the, we trap the, the waste. We have constructed seven, we call it a log boom, or waste trap along the Klang River from PJ up until the river mouth. And also we have collaborated with the NGO, we call it uh, the Ocean Cleanup from Amsterdam. They have uh, support, supported us in terms of giving us the right to use the, the interceptor. This interceptor complement the existing our river cleaning operation. And after we trap the waste, we extract or excavate using uh, excavator. We have five units of excavator currently working along the Klang River. And we transport it to, to the landfill eventually. And of course, we do manual sorting, but it's a small scale, manual sorting. We ex uh, some of our workers, they extract uh, plastic usable item before we transport it to the landfill. So generally, we feel that there's a lot of areas for improvement that we can do in terms of our existing operation. Number one, the existing operation, we cannot, we still cannot stop uh, rubbish, rubbish from entering the river. Number two, the, it is labor intensive operation. Currently, we are working with 30 uh, workers work on a daily, daily basis. And it's very costly. Approximately, we have uh, done some calculation. We spend about 150 metric ton to clear the rubbish from the river and it's, it's not sustainable. And of course we do manual sorting, but there's no data. 
to analyze uh, in terms of the composition of the waste. So there's a lot of improvement that we can do to improve our river cleaning operation. So moving forward, next slide. There are a few areas that we feel we can uh, do some for the enhancement. It's like for floating debris. We know that we still cannot stop rubbish from entering the, the river. And what we have done so far, we, we would like to enhance our public awareness. We do some gotoroyong with uh, people along the Klang River, but this needs to be further enhanced. And on top of uh, engaging all the, popula all the villages along the Klang River, we also engage the NGOs, local NGOs. We are doing uh, programs. We do awareness about the problem that we have in the Klang River. And of course, we also, starting from this year, we also want to enhance collaboration with the agencies, especially the local authorities, but because we know um, they are the enforcement agency. We have shared information on how, how much the waste that we've collected along the, the river, where is the critical area that need further uh, the attention from them and with all this program that we had uh, in place the we expect that the reduction of floating debris in river the, the the floating debris in river will further reduce in future and of course in terms of the recycling and recovery we know that our existing operation is not sustainable we just do a manual recovery and recycling activity, we need a strategic collaborator. With that, starting this year, we had uh, collaborating with Magic to do innovation challenge. We call it innovation challenge 2021, whereby we invite people from, especially younger generation, to come up with an idea on what we can do to convert the waste into something uh, commercially viable products. Also, we are now in the collaborating with Nestle Malaysia Berhad to test for the pilot project on waste conversion in one of our critical op critical operation area in Shah Alam. And also, we are looking for, aggressively looking for technology and business partner for high scale recycle and recovery solution if it's commercially viable. So with that, we we intend, our vision is we want to minimize, not only we want to reduce the waste from going into the river, but also we want to minimize waste to the landfill. Next slide. This is some photo before and after river cleaning activity. The first photo was taken uh, in December 2015. You can see there's a lot of uh, rubbish. Same location. And now, after uh, extensive river cleaning operation, we can see the impact. Number one, we get a cleaner river. Number two, water quality had improved. As I mentioned earlier, before we do a river cleaning, generally the water quality at class five, which is very polluted. Now, on average, we recorded class three and above in terms of the water quality. Number three, we have seen resurgence of uh, wildlife activity along the Klang River. Family of waters coming. We can, uh, there's a news about crocodile at the Klang River. Then uh, there are more people come and do fishing activities at the Klan River. So this is something positive that we have seen uh, after we do uh, our river, after we clean the river. And of course, finally, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, we have unlocked a few potential development along, along the Klan River. And we will start the development project hopefully uh, in 2022, after, after all this MCO 
COVID problem, we will start our riverbank development. So, <clears throat> not only in select in uh, not only Klang River, actually in Selangor we has a lot more rivers to manage. We have Sungai Selangor, Sungai Semenyi, Sungai Bernam, Sungai Langat, Sungai Damansara. So this aspect, uh, uh, rivers in Selangor is very important. As we all know, 90% of our water supply comes from river. We feel that if we do not tackle this problem now, it will become a big problem in future. So, next, I have been, I've always been asked about the question whether it is worth to spend to clean the river. Is there any correlation between the economic growth and river pollution? Previously, it is very difficult for me to answer. Of course, we as the uh, project manager, we can see there's a lot of potential if our rivers are clean. But fortunately, in 2019, there was a report produced by the World Bank. And the report says economic growth and river pollution are intrinsically linked. Especially when the river is polluted, the downstream region will be much affected. So as we can see, in, uh, based on our experience, like Klang River, previously we asked why PJ, Shah Alam, Subang Jaya is far uh, developed than the downstream region, Klang. And now we have the answer because of the river is polluted. So actually there's a lot of, uh, I would prefer to have uh, more Q&A. Uh, this is something that we have done in Selengo at this point of time. And uh, on, on top of river cleaning, as I said earlier, uh, starting next year, we are moving towards uh, river bank development because we manage after we've done, we have done a lot of river cleaning activity and all that, we've managed to unlock a uh, few development potential along the Klang River. It will comprise of uh, residential development, of course, and uh, commercial development. Uh, and also tourism related development and we use, we will use the river as the transportation network we'll have our river taxi to start operation uh, next year and this river taxi operation we are collaborating with fishermen um, association in Klang so it has the uh, impact towards the local community. We want to give opportunity to all, not only to the big company, to the technology partner, but of course, to the people uh, along the Klang River so that they can uh, appreciate, they can uh, be part of our, our, our activity. So with that, next, we have a lot more to share. Please follow us, our Instagram and Facebook, Selangor Maritime Gateway. Or you can uh, go to our website and in fact in our website we have uh, online uh, real-time data on the water quality at the Klang River. If you have uh, any further question, maybe we can discuss, uh, we start our other Q&A session. Thank you.
Hi, Mr. Shaiful. Hi. Thank you so much for your presentation. I saw it and I was like, holy landfill. I had no idea that we had this much rubbish that, that are going into our rivers. Um, and I think a lot of us complain about the water quality, but we don't realize how much of the, the rubbish that goes into the water is yeah. perhaps our fault. But, um, but, but, however, we do have some questions from the audience members, and they are also yeah. quite interested in this. Um, so we have one question from AC Lam. Thank you, AC Lam, from Zoom for your question. And the question is, can the Malacca model be ad adopted? Uh, of course, that is on a much smaller scale, but aren't the principles, um, but don't the principles remain the same? So what do you think, Encik Shaifo? Okay, thank you uh, to AC Lam eh, for asking the this interesting question, can, can Malacca model be adopted? So to a certain extent, we are adopting what have, what have been done in Malacca. Actually, previously, they have a similar issue with us. They have a rubbish problem, they have a water quality problem and all that. But looking at it, uh, we have also to take into consideration the profile of the river. Like in Malacca, it's only 3.5 kilometer. Here we have from Mid Valley to, to Klang, it's about 56 kilometer. And it cut across a few uh, local authorities. And also, our river is white. We have a natural river. And you can see the amount of rubb rubbish that we have. And like uh, <coughs> one of the things in uh, river development is the funding issue. Like Malacca model, they are lucky. They got federal funding. I was uh, informed that it is almost uh, half a billion to do some uh, uh, enhancement, rejuve rejuvenation, infrastructure work. But here in Selangor, we have to make this project sustainable. Of course, uh, state government uh, had, had given some initial, in initial assistance, financial assistance to us. But we have to, to show that river development is sustainable. That's why we are doing two things here. Number one is river cleaning. But we know river cleaning is not sustainable. Initially, we thought river cleaning is not sustainable. But now, with our initiative to do recovery, recycling, we can see there's a lot of potential in just river cleaning alone. And next phase is that we are moving to a river development. As uh, opposed to, as, as in, in Malacca, they are uh, quite lucky because uh, the river uh, cut across the existing tourism spot. They cut across the main town. But here in Klang River, we have to create that destination for people to come and, and uh, enjoy the river. So uh, to conclude the answer, yes, to a certain extent, we can adopt the Malacca model, but there are few things that we have to take into consideration, as I mentioned earlier. Number one is the profile of the river and the sustainable, sustainable funding model. I hope I can, I can answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Encik Shaifo, for that. And I think it's also a good reminder to our audience members um, who might be watching. We can also um, petition our government to make changes and we can also, as managers and as individuals, I guess, uh, help in uh, the manpower aspect of uh, the cleanup. You can count on me signing up after this. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. So if I were to sign up, where would I sign up, yeah, for this? I, I, we, uh, in our Facebook and Instagram. All right, thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank so you. unfortunately, we do have some questions, but we've run out of time. Um, so I would like to thank you so much for your presentation. And perhaps before we go, uh, would you like to have any last words to our audience members? Yeah. Apparently, during the MCO, we have seen the, the river is cleaner for the past two years, 2020 and 2021. So we believe that the pollution comes from us. It's not, the river does not pollute itself. It's from people. So I urge uh, all uh, Selangorean especially to do self-enforcement. Remember, anything that we throw eventually will go into the river. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Encik Shaifu, for that reminder. Um, also, looking at the, the daunting landfills, I think I'm going to start um, either eating my rubbish or recycling it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you so much, Auntie Shaifu, and thank you so much to the audience members for having, uh, for taking an interest and for being here and for asking questions. We are going to come back soon with one last case study. Um, bye, guys.
Thank you. Hey guys welcome back i don't know about you but that last one was very very eye-opening and i think the next one will be as well our final session today will be conducted by rashfin pal singh the group ceo of bgbg Initi uh, initiative which is one of malaysia's pioneering and award-winning social enterprises that champions sustainability the company comprises of subsidiaries across a few industries in ethical fashion circular economy solutions and their latest venture marae which is an innovative and alternative education model designed to build 21st century talents. Great to have you with us today, Rashfin. Soon he's getting ready and he will share his initiatives with you. If you guys do have any questions in the audience, please do drop it in your chat box or in the comment section um, and then we will pick the best one to ask Rashfin. So now he's getting ready. We'll see with you. Uh, we'll, he'll be back with you soon. Star Circular Economy Conference 2021. I'm Rashwin Pal Singh and I'll be sharing with you today about capturing the value of waste. And this is something that's very, very close and very important to us at BGBG. So I'm quite happy to share with you the different ways that we look at this. Um, in today's presentation, I'll be sharing with you a bit about how we do it at BGBG, how we've observed our other industry partners also working on capturing the value of waste. And lastly, I will end with what are the key enablers that make this happen. So I'll keep it short. I've got 15 minutes to do this and let's go. So just an overview though. So at BGBG, we run two big teams. There is the BGBG team and the Mareka team. At BGBG, we focus on sustainability and environment work. BGBG initiative focus on circular economy, mostly plastics type 2 and type 5. BGBG ethical fashion is a fashion unit that makes bags and other lifestyle accessories using discarded materials. On the Mareka side, it's more to do with education, digital entrepreneurship, access to tools, technology, machinery, how to make things, and as well as we work with Taylor's University to run a makerspace with them, looking at how to enhance the value in tertiary education to connect with real world problems. So in capturing the value of waste, Right. I think the big, so we all know recycling, right? That's something we're all very familiar with. Um, however, in capturing the value of waste, upcycling is something which is, I wouldn't say new, it's been around for many years, but it's, it's the approach that we would use to appreciate a material in its intrinsic form. 
So as you know, a lot of us, we tend to have a very transactional value relationship with products, right? We use it only for that momentary minute or day or hours and then we throw it away. Upcycling is looking at the material for its intrinsic value. What is it made of? What can it be used for something else? And then applying creativity to change that. So if you've observed around, you will notice there's probably two types of upcycling. On one side, there is the artistic and custom design, which, you know, is all about creativity, using unique parts. You've probably seen, you know, cafes with a half-cut car. You've probably seen, you know, um, products made out of waste materials. That's on the artistic custom design side. On the production side is where we work with factories to get raw materials to convert them at a larger scale. These are the key enablers, of course, as you know. But let's go a bit deeper, right? What is the difference between the two types? So on the artistic side, it's very much working with unique parts. Now, I'll be honest, when we started BGBG, we were doing more of the artistic custom design side of upcycling, right? You would look at a piece of material or furniture or a piece of wood, and you would look at how that could be transformed. There's a lot of design element into this. It tends to be very community-centric, and the models tend to revolve around B2C, which is direct to consumers, or B2B models. However, we've also seen a huge growth in production-based upcycling. Now, the key difference here is really the reliance of a steady supply of the same material. Now, imagine if you've come up with a particular design and you want to make this in volume. Now, here's when you need to have partnerships with factories that produce disposed consumer waste, and then you, you want to integrate that into your production process. This is now more process-centric. And of course, this also applies to a B2B and B2C model. So let's have a look right, at what are the different um, organizations or styles that we could capture the value of waste. So this is the more artistic side, right? We've seen independent movements of people coming up with secondhand shops, thrift shops, as some of us may call it, right? Or just people applying creativity to themselves. So textiles, I've seen quite a lot of this happening. Um, it's very accessible to people. People tend to have the machines back home. They tend to do it themselves. Um, we've also seen fun upcycle and hack style events where people make things, you know, mix and match. People people have done like clothes swap days. Right? I've got a friend, Melissa. She does this quite a lot, Melissa Tan. Um, so this is quite nice from an artistic and custom design side of things. On the production side, though, there are some really interesting brands out there. Right? So Freitag is probably the, you know, the big um, popular organization that we all know. They work with lorry canvases in Switzerland. Elvis and Chris is based in the UK. They work with discarded fire hoses. And Mimo is another global brand that uses rubber tires. When I was in South Africa a couple of years ago, I stumbled across these guys, and they work with all yacht sales. So they're based in Cape Town. They have close relationships with the suppliers. And if you notice both sides, right, it's about close relationships with the companies that make this. And you want to be able to ensure you get a steady supply. Now, what is unique is that oftentimes each product tends to be different, right? Um, or slight variations. But generally, you need to maintain a standard or pretty predictable look and feel. Closer to home, um, at BGBG, we work with four different materials. So we work with discarded car seat belts, what we're quite well known to be doing. We have a partnership with a Japanese kimono maker, getting vintage kimonos from them called Nakakoma Orimono on hold at the moment. We work with event companies to get their felt materials and of course even banner materials. So felt is typically what we use for event carpets and banners as you know um, it's quite less now because not many events happening and most of these things are digital but when things pick up we see a lot of these materials being generated through the events industry and we look at how to convert them into lifestyle products. Some of the things that we do at BGBG you can of course check out our shop. This is the kimono. So at seatbelt products, they were again more predictable because of easier to de design because of the color and the form. But when you're talking about kimonos, that becomes super unique. Each one is different. So it does become quite tricky in, the term in terms of putting this out there on an e-commerce platform because there's a lot of photos to be taken and upgraded. However, it is very unique. So moving on on the plastic side, we've also seen artistic custom design on upcycling of plastic. We've done this quite a bit. We've seen global partners do this, right? Um, again, some really cool art installations that I've seen. Just people, you know, on one side, I find it very inspiring when people do, do waste with art because it really transforms your imagination of something. 
right? It pushes you to think about the material differently. It makes you question your transactional relationship, our transactional relationship with things, and makes us just wonder, what else could I do with something? Closer to home, um, a lot of there's three organizations that work with Precious Plastic. So Precious Plastic is a global movement of, let's say, small-scale prototyping or small-scale plastic recycling to be made into new products. And they've come up with an ingenious open source design that is being replicated. And these are some of the products that is made of type 2 and type 5. In Malaysia, we work on this. We work with two communities. Um, one is in Gomba, an Orang Asti community. One more is in Selayang, a semi-urban community. So we provide them training on how they would operate the machines, collect the products. We work with two very awesome community partners over here. One being the Sea Monkeys Project and the other one being Fuse Ecotier. Both are based in Malaysia. Now from there, once the community understands the value of it, we look at how they can operate the machines. We as enablers help them to bring corporate orders so that these corporate orders get to, get to utilize the waste materials within these communities and at the same time also providing them source of income. And what we've seen work quite well is that, you know, although it's only type 2 and type 5, when once, local, once communities see the value of a material, it changes the larger perception they have. And they start looking at things differently, they start looking at other ways to reuse things. And I think what's quite nice is that we, we get to create a systemic shift of mindsets and habits. Now on the other stuff, on also the art and custom design, we've seen some really fantastic local metal artists or waste artists, so to say, right? So with the metal stuff, it's really fantastic. It's huge. It's, you know, bold. It's quite powerful. And each of it is custom and unique. So we've got an in-house waste artist called William Kung. Um, he and his teammate Faris, they make fantastic sculptures. Right, and all of it will start by picking out the materials, looking at it, imagining it, and then incorporating it into a design. You can check out his work um, on Instagram. Right, this is some of the other stuff he's done. This is actually up in Gentings. Now, on the larger production side, you've probably heard from Vinish from Fat Hopes. This is a local company I'm super proud of. They work with discarded cooking oil or waste cooking oil, and they convert them into various different upstream, for example, biofuel with the airlines industry. We've seen local companies or actually regional companies like GrabCycle and BioBean. GrabCycle looks at connecting people with waste food from supermarkets, especially with communities. BioBean looks at coffee ground converted into fertilizer, or so you could say compost. And yes, so what is unique is this, right? There's so many different ideas in you know, opportunities within this. So I think it's quite important that we reflect how do we do this and how do we go about making this happen. So for us at BGBG, it's really a lot about making, breaking, designing stuff. And that's also hence why we have a sister organization called Mareka. Mareka runs a makerspace in Publica and we've got all these different labs. And at Mareka, we also have access to all these different waste materials. And we encourage our designers, our makers, our community, our hobbies to come, touch, feel, look at it, get access to the tools. So we really want to push the boundaries of innovation over here, how people can reimagine consumption, reimagine materials. Now, there's only so much we can do. And there's, we also work with Taylor's University quite closely. So this is a very fantastic partnership that I, that I really appreciate because we get to run the makerspace with them. They get access to the projects that we do. In return, we get access to the larger university academic talent and facilities. And together, we are looking at a lot of sustainability-related projects. And this is really a good partnership of two, you know, good two strategic partners, right? Basically, who we need access to bigger machinery. We need access to high-end talent. They need access to grassroots projects, real-world projects. And together, we are able to unlock this for each other. And of course, there's also closing the loop with making sure these materials ends up in consumers, right? So we want to replace, you could say, non-sustainable materials. So we work with a few different partners to implement Saimdavi, Yaifan Saimdavi and Hasana, who works with us on grassroots projects to implement this. The other partners work with us on procuring these products and putting them back into the economy. So yes, that's all for me. I think I've done quite well with time. Um, that's my email, rashwin at bg.com. 
And yes, happy to have a few questions. Hi, Rashbin. Welcome back. How are you feeling? Good, good. Hey, Myra. Hi. Thanks so much for that presentation. I think I saw quite a lot of opportunities there um, in places in where you can you know, network and work together. But I think our audience members are also quite interested and they have some questions for you. So are you ready, Rashbin? Let's go. Let's go. All right, cool. So our first question. Major industries profit highly from business modeling, uh, rising in high volume of wastage on the consumer side. So how do we tackle uh, decreasing wastage instead? Okay, so this is a fantastic question. And, you know, I have to agree with um, the person who shared this, right? If you ask me, though, a lot of this problem in terms of waste and single-use plastic, single-use waste is really created at the production side, right? So we've, we've seen massive FMCG companies like profiting just from making single-use products. And when those products, imagine plastic bottles, imagine wrappers, imagine sachets, right? Imagine once those products are utilized, they end in the landfill or they end in the drains, this now becomes a cost to local city councils, right? Or the local government. And there is a huge disconnect between the tax that is being paid and the profits that's being reaped. So it has been boggling us for a while. And I think a lot of discussion has happened globally on how to tackle this. One fantastic thing I'm seeing happen is that the WWF is championing in Southeast Asian region a, a policy in a movement called EPR, which is Extended Producer Responsibility. So what they're doing is they're looking at, they're actually cap, quantifying this cost. What is it that is cost, costing to the environment or local city councils to recycle the waste being produced by big companies? They're putting a value to this. These companies would then ha either have to pay a tax to the city council or they would have to reimburse local communities to recycle it themselves. So I think the buck has to stop at the producers and I think EPR, what's being championed by WWF, does seem to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you for the answer, Rashvin. And uh, it's very interesting because before this, we had someone on talking about uh, the wastage in landfills. So I guess we kind of now know a little bit more about uh, another aspect of that, as of where that waste comes from as well. So thank you so much. Um, for that answer. We also have another question for you. Um, and, oh, this is a little spicy. Can you, <laughs> this question is a little spicy. So the question is, is it profitable to do artistic upcycling? Um, does it look like it can cater for a mass market? Rashvin, what would you say to that? Absolutely. Um, I think that's on point. So when we started off with up artistic upcycling, we realized that it's quite hard to build a business model around it, especially for an organization. Um, I've seen many individuals succeed at this um, from a personal scale, but you are right. It, it is quite tough to, to... Artistic upcycling, honestly, for me, is something which is there from an artistic perspective to evoke 
thoughts to, to inspire people to think differently. Yes, it, it does not solve the larger scale problem because it works with very unique parts and small amount of quantity. So it's profitable on a small scale. It doesn't solve the big problem, but it has the potential to inspire millions. And I think that's important. Thank you so much for that um, very honest answer, Rashvin. Um, th yeah, thank you so much for that honest answer. And it's um, and as a, a person, I guess, who's inclined to artistry myself, I think it's quite sad to see a lot of the artists' work go um, kind of un unseen, especially since a lot of the the the. I think personally, I think a lot of the statues that you you saw, the the artwork that you should mm, the be sculptures, watching, yes. Yeah, would be really great. Uh, would be really great opportunities for corporate to to you know kind of. Actually, that's a good point, great. Myra, because what what we've done, the fantastic project in the past was with EcoWorld, where we took their waste from their construction site and converted that as an art piece for their new residents. So it's quite nice. There was a close the loop um, story over there, angle over there. Oh my god, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Ashwin, for that. Um, also, I think, unfortunately, we have run out of time for our questions. Um, thank you so much, Rashvin, for your presentation and your answers and um, for your honesty. Um, but before we go, do you have any last things to say to the audience member? Um, yeah, I hope everyone's keeping well. And I honestly, I would say that this has to be a two-pronged approach. Whilst I agree, we no longer need awareness on circular economy. Like, we've passed the awareness stage, we need maximum action. I'm a proponent of like policy driven stuff as well because I think it's time for like hard hitting actions. But I think that personal actions of how we can shift decision making through our dollar. So by buying from ethical suppliers, green suppliers, FSC certified suppliers, I think you really get to support the alternative economy, which will soon become the mainstream economy. So let's All not right. underestimate our personal efforts into this. Yeah, no, that's that's the point. Um, I think uh, in Malaysia we have a saying, "Sikit sikit lama lama jadi bukit." So that <laughs> means uh, we you have a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, and eventually it'll become a mountain. So thank you so much for that, um, and also thank you to the audience for your questions and for your engagement. Um, we're very happy to have you here, and uh, see you guys soon. Bye, Ashwin. Bye. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard from so many local as well as international businesses on um, how to close the circle and how to work together. Um, and we have almost come to the end of the Star Circular Economy 2021 Live Virtual Conference. Um, on behalf of Star Media Group, I would like to thank our sponsors, speakers, panelists, moderators, and our audience members once again for joining us in making this event program a great success. Thank you very much on joining us in this two-day journey on Star Circular Economy 2021 Live Virtual Conference. And please do stay on to complete a quick poll to help us understand how we can serve you better in our future Star Media Group events. Um, and with that, Star Circular Economy Conference 2021 is a wrap. And we sincerely hope that you have enjoyed and benefited from this two-day conference program produced by the Events Business New Unit of Star Media Group. If you need any assistance from us, please do email us at events at thestar.com.my. Once again, my name is Myra Baiti and I'm signing out. Thank you and we look forward to hosting you again at the next Star Media Group event. Bye, guys. <laughs>